This is a planning meeting with public participation, not a public meeting. Therefore, only persons registered to speak will be allowed to do so during the evening. We will be webcast, so into the big wide world. Uh, if you don't wish to be seen on that, please let a, an officer know at the appropriate time. Um, there are no fire alarms scheduled this evening that I'm aware of, so if you do hear an alarm, it is a genuine one. If you make your way out of the main entrance, down is the car park by the side of the windmill pub. Uh, not in the pub, by the side of it, thank you. Right, uh, the items before us, as you'll see, there are some uh, update sheets uh, for late breaking news. Members, have you had an opportunity to, to look through those? Thank you. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll just get on. Um, I'd like the uh, officers to introduce themselves, starting from my right, please. Caroline Nash, Committee Administrator. Ross Chambers, Legal Services. Karen Tate, Committee Manager. Alice Cosnet, Senior Planner. Anthony, Anthony Young, Senior Planner. Eddie Wrench, Senior Planner. Amy Fleet, Planning Officer. Thank you. The, um, I think we can move into the agenda, can't we? We'll move into the agenda. Um, first of all, apologies for absence. Chairman, apologies received from Councillor Vaudry and Councillor Richards, for whom Councillor Fielding is substituting. And thank you very much indeed for doing that, Councillor. Disclosures of interest members. Councillor Payne. Thank you. And on that particular point, because I'm um, also predetermined on that, I'll be signing down on that item. Thank you. Councillor Coach. Uh, yeah, I've had, uh, I think, correspondence on item five. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I think item five, Tiddington Road, and uh, item ten, Middletown. And I've spoken to the applicant for Middletown, but I haven't determined, so I shall sit in. I think we've all uh, received some um, notification from the applicants on that particular point. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lawton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, item uh, four. Yeah, uh, 17 of Leak 0258 Vary. This is the Ledger Plan. I shall be speaking uh, against this as Parish Council Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the procedure for this evening's uh, items is as follows. Uh, the officer will do an um, introduction on the item. Uh, we'll then go through the speakers. Uh, that will be the uh, parish and town councils, objectors, and applicants. It will give them three minutes normally, unless there are, there are two speakers, in which case you get a commissioner time of six minutes. Then the ward member is allowed to speak for up to five minutes. We then go into uh, technical items with the uh, officer and then to debate, and then we will take a vote on this. Members, before we proceed, um, just for a smoothness of uh, proceedings, uh, for the item that I will be standing down on, we will obviously have to nominate a chair. I would like to nominate Councillor Lawton. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Thank you very much indeed. All those in favour? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Right, thank you very much indeed for that. Right, our first item on the agenda this evening then is 17-01729-4 and 17-01730-LBC, 38-39 to Waterside, Stratford-upon-Avon. Over to Alice. Thank you, Chairman. As members will be aware, a site visit took place this afternoon. Councillors Cargill, Fielding and Lawton were in attendance. The application site, which is noted by the black dot in the centre of the plan, is located in the town centre of Stratford-on-Avon. The site, which is outlined in red, is located on the corner of Waterside and Chapel Lane. It comprises the RSC Costume Workshop and Chapel Lane offices. The Costume Workshop is currently operated from the Scene Dock building and barn, which are both Grade 2 listed buildings, as well as from modern additions, which extend between them and the Chapel Lane offices. The buildings coloured red on the plan denote listed buildings, as is apparent from the plan, a number of Grade 2 listed buildings adjoin the site, as well as the Grade 2 star listed Royal Shakespeare and Swan Theatre being located to the other side of Waterside. Here the existing site plan can be seen, with Waterside to the bottom of the slide and Chapel Lane to the left-hand side of the slide. 
Annotation on the plan clarifies the location of the seam dock building and barn with the more modern additions extending off them. Full planning permission and listed building consent is sought for the renovation and part redevelopment of the costume workshop to provide improved workshops and offices for the RSC. This would comprise alterations to the Grade 2 listed seam dock building and barn, as well as the demolition of a range of modern additions and their replacement with one and two storey extensions, to include a green roof link to the existing Chapel Lane offices to the rear of the site. The elevation at the top of this slide shows how the proposed extensions would protrude above the roofs of the listed buildings which front onto Waterside. The bottom elevation shows the same view of the building, but as a section through the scene dock building. The grey areas of the elevations would be constructed in red brick, with the stripes indicating areas of Brie Soleil. The elevation at the top of the slide shows the proposed extensions from Chapel Lane, with the bottom elevation showing the elevation behind the cottages, which front on to Chapel Lane. The pitched roofs would be finished with slate. This shows the northern elevation, with Waterside on the left-hand side of the slide and the existing Chapel Lane offices on the right-hand side. And this shows the elevation facing the Chapel Lane offices to the rear of the site. The white rectangle denotes the section which has been taken through the green roof link from the extension to the existing Chapel Lane offices. This photo shows the view of the site from Waterside. The Grade 2 listed seam sock building is annotated with the listed barn and modern additions toward the rear of the cottages, which can be seen in this photo. And this is taken from Chapel Lane. The existing RSC offices can be seen on the left-hand side of the slide, with the rear elevation of the seam dock building just visible in the centre of the photo. The Royal Shakespeare and Swan Theatres can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide. And just to take you through a few photos as taken from the theatre tower. So, oh, my cursor isn't working. If I just come out of there a moment. So you can see here is the seam dock building, the listed barn, and the modern additions to be demolished. Similarly, you can see the seam dock building, the barn, and the modern additions to be demolished here. And then another pan round photo. Members should note that there are an update to the application which is detailed within the update sheet. Chairman, the recommendation is to approve both applications for planning permission and listed building consent as per the recommendations as set out in the committee report and the conditions detailed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, uh, our speakers this evening are the applicants, which is Catherine Mullion, Stephen Rebeck and Greg Davis. Thank you. You have three minutes um, in your own time. I'll give a 30-second warning approximately before we go. Yes, um, don't get too close to the microphone. Just speak clearly. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for your time. Our RSC costumes are essential to the success and quality of our work on stage. They're enjoyed by millions of people across the world every year, and they play a crucial part in helping actors create their characters. We have the largest in-house costume making department of any British theatre, and costume making here has a very long history. The 30 craftspeople who work on site cover every specialist costume making skill. They also maintain all the costumes during the life of the show, which is why proximity to the theatre is essential. The extremely cramped costume workshop accommodation has <coughs> poor ventilation and temperature control, limited daylight, insufficient storage, Floor levels that do not match, narrow passageways, low beams causing hazards, tightly laid stairs, and there is no lift. It's not an accessible building in any way. The constraints of the working conditions cause a range of health and safety issues. They severely restrict our ability to develop our processes and prevent us teaching craft skills to the next generation of costume makers. Overall, the workshop is not fit for purpose. Our proposal for the restoration and redevelopment of the costume workshop has four clear aims. Firstly, to create the best facilities for world-class costume making in the heart of Stratford-upon-Avon. Secondly, to care for the important heritage grade two listed buildings, including the 1887 scene dock, which will become a new entrance to the RSC's offices. Thirdly, to create new training and apprenticeship opportunities and secure the future of costume making in the town. 
and finally to enable visitors for the first time to experience our workshop through tours and online. In developing the scheme, we've been mindful of the challenges of the site and its location in a conservation area. We acknowledge the proximity of the workshop to the surrounding residential property, the majority of which are occupied on short-term lets by our RSC actors, but also include the Arden Hotel, Ted and Newtel, and we're consulting closely with everyone. We have also undertaken extensive pre-application specialist dialogue and responded to all recommendations. We are also mindful of the need to minimise disruption from the construction work. We engage local contractors at an early stage to obtain logistics and buildability advice, and we'll be using this to develop our effective construction management plan. In summary, we want to create a costume workshop facility in Stratford-upon-Avon that is absolutely fit for the 21st century, supports the success of the RSC, and which sits well within the plan. 25, 25 seconds, please. Oh, that's it. Okay, sorry to interrupt you then. You may do that last little bit again if you wish to. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Members, are there any questions you would like to ask? Councillor Fielding. Just a quick one. With regards to the flood barriers that have been tested on, along the riverbank, have you taken any precautions with regards to flooding that may, may occur? I hope not. I've done detailed work in that area. I might ask Greg to talk to that. Oh my word, are we all right? <laughs> yes, advice has been taken as part of, as part of the design um, and the design has considered uh, where certain elements are to be situated within, um, within the workshop space. Um, the front area, um, as we've seen as part of your work or walk around today, is the area potentially at most risk. However, falls within the one in A remember the exact number of years it's in the report and I'd have to refer to it um, floodplains so we've taken advice we've consulted we've taken flood risk assessments um, and we feel confident that how we've designed it will address it may I ask sorry I may I ask a question I mean, obviously I, having been around the, the, the facility I do appreciate how constrained it is for you and uh, for the development I've, I also I think you have some very valued workers local people working there. Would you envisage perhaps this facility expanding in any way with the new development? Oh, absolutely. That one of the main reasons, as I alluded to probably quite briefly in that drop through, is, is that we at the moment cannot employ anyone else on the site and we can't offer training and apprenticeship opportunities. And we will be doing that in the future. Um, Steve, who, who has oversight of that department, can talk a little bit more about the apprenticeships we're going to develop. Yeah, we're certainly planning on um, introducing, we, we, we've introduced apprentices recently into the RSC and various other departments. We've currently got five um, uh, and the other various other technical departments, but we're certainly planning, uh, once space allows, to introduce uh, initially two apprentices by 2020-21 uh, um, uh, and thereafter continuing with uh, replacing those at, at least every time, every time they uh, uh, graduate from their apprenticeship. Uh, two to start with, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, more, uh, increase those numbers because there are, within the costume departments, there are quite a few departments uh, from armory to wig making to, to um, uh, shoe making, uh, as, well as, as well as making dresses and, uh, and male costumes as well. Yes, it is quite diverse. Councillor Lawton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I thoroughly enjoyed our, uh, our trip around this afternoon, and I agree with the chairman that the facilities there are medieval, if not Victorian. Um, one thing that's interesting, and perhaps members might like to know, is what the proposals are for uh, general public access to the new facility, uh, and how, how you see that working. Yes, oh, Steve, you were leaping. Please no, I wasn't particularly, um, but we, we certainly we have an activity plan that we put together um, that covers a wide range of uh, public access activities from, from tours around the department itself to see um, we, the dilemma is of course how you do a tour without interrupting the making of the costumes but we've devised a route around the new space that will allow the public to look into the workshops uh, while the work is taking place. We've also got various interactive uh, um, virtual reality plans to, to, to install within, within the, the listed barn there which is going to be a multi-use space for, uh, for the start of tours, for talks, for lectures, the, the education department will be bringing 
students in to talk about the art of costume making. So we've got quite a quite an extensive plan for interactive uh, work with the, with the public, and it will become part of the RSC um, uh, tours for the public. Lovely, thank you. Are there any other questions, members? Go on, Council, if you wait. On the left-hand side of the plan, there looks like a, um, a roadway in. Is that just a footpath in, or is that a means of bringing in materials and, and stuff onto the site? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a pedestrian access, um, largely for the staff to take costumes to and from the theatre, in fact, rather than coming through the, the reception area, which is a public space. So there, there will be hand deliveries probably around the back there, but it's largely to get to get costumes from the, from the workshops over to the over to the theatres. No, it's non-vehicle; it's, it's purely, purely pedestrian. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. If you could just turn your microphones off, thank you. All right, um, at Councillor Franchley, did you wish to speak? You're the ward member. Yes, thank you. You can, you can sit down back. Yes, thank you very much. Very, very briefly, a ward member, I completely and thoroughly support this application. Wow, Jenny, that was fast. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> thank you. Are there any technical questions you would like to ask um, Alice, Councillor Giles, and then Councillor Barr? Um, <coughs> Just looking at one paragraph on page 13, I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get is a sense of from Waterside and particularly Bancroft Gardens to what degree the built form is going to be visible from street level behind that. And because, it, you know, I haven't got any sort of heights or anything, so I just sort of can't get a sense of to, to what degree it's going to be visible. I do actually have a, a visualisation which has been provided by the architect. So let me just show you that and hopefully that'll give you a, a good indication. So if we make that a bit larger. Um, so these are basically the gabled ends that you'd see from those elevations. Similarly on the other side, the gables would protrude in a similar fashion, but obviously you'd never get far enough back to be able to see it based on like in the elevation because of the theatre being so close, but hopefully that gives you some understanding as to how it would look. And are the materials in that visualization pretty accurate in terms of what we're gonna be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So the gables would be largely red brick. Um, we've actually had a sample in, but we've conditioned a sample panel as well, just to confirm mortar. But it was a Warwickshire red brick. We, we're satisfied that it's very typical in terms of what's in the, in the area. Councillor Barnes. No, no questions. Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Alice, that's great, that visualisation, that's, that's perfect. Is the one provided by the architect for the visualisation looking from Chapel Lane? No, unfortunately no. I haven't been provided with, with that. I mean, I can p pull up the elevations again. If, if you could, because yeah. I'm just a little bit confused about what I was looking at during your presentation, I'm sorry. So let me make this a bit bigger. So you've got the RSC Chapel Lane offices here. So these are the cottages which front onto Chapel Lane and, and bend around the corner onto Waterside. So these are basically the roofs which you would see over the top of the cottages. Again, because you can't step back far enough, I don't, you would never see it at that exact angle. Obviously you would see it coming this way down Chapel Lane, um, but I don't have, I have the rear elevation, but I don't have that sort of angled view or visualization from, from the architect. Do you want me to pull up? Well, sorry, that's the angle. Oh. I wasn't quite sure where, where I'm looking at. Okay. When I'm looking at that, where am I standing? So here you're essentially standing in the middle of the Chapel Lane offices. So you've got the single story link from the proposed extension into the Chapel Lane offices. So if we're standing here, we're looking towards Waterside beyond the building. So at the back of that, you've basically got the Royal Shakespeare Theatres in the background. But it's not shown, no. We've just got the elevation of, of the, the proposed Thanks, building. Thanks, Alice. That's what okay. I couldn't quite get, get right. Yeah, okay, lovely. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, over to debate. Anyone like to counter Giles? Um, I would have thought it's taken an awful lot of hard work to come up with such a good and sensitive proposal in such a constrained site. It clearly has huge public benefit, and I'm very happy to support it and would propose a grant. Thank you. Councillor Barnes, Councillor Kerridge. Yes, uh, I'm very happy to second it, and 
from what I can gather from yesterday and the day before, it is on the new floodplain system because they closed all the roads. So uh, flooding won't be a problem there. Uh, and as I say, a lot of work's gone into it and it's what we needed and I'm happy to second it. Thank you. Well, I, I should just say also from my perspective, having seen it and um, Councillor Lawton did make the, the comparison between the jewellery court <laughs> and, and the, it is an old fashioned building not fit for, for, for purpose, as was mentioned by the applicants, and not for the modern age as well, to attract young new designers and, and costumiers, etc. So I think it's a really baffle um, thing. Yes, members, just to remind you that there are two um, votes this evening. The first one is on 17-01, uh, 729-4, and then 1730-LBC. So I have a proposal and a seconder for the first item. Uh, we'll take the vote on that one. Members of the vote before you is to grant planning permission for 17-01729-4. All those in favour? That's unanimous, Chairman. And do I have a proposer? In fact, I'll propose the 17-01730-LBC. Uh, do I have a seconder? Councillor Fielding. Uh, all those in favour? That's unanimous again. Thank you. This committee therefore resolves to pass planning permission for 17-01729-4 and 17-01730-LBC. Thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you. Our next item on the agenda. Uh, again, this is Alice. This is 17 slash 01474 slash full. And it is 78 Tiddington Road, Stratford on Avon. I do not have um, parish t um, speakers. The first person, um, sorry, Alice, if you'd like to do your, sorry, I only, only, only short circuited you there, didn't I? You carry on, you carry on, don't worry. Thank you, Chairman. Members will be aware that a member's site visit took place this afternoon. Again, councillors Cargill, Fielding and Lawton were in attendance. The application site is denoted by the black dot in the centre of the plan and is located on Tiddington Road within the built-up area boundary of Stratford-on-Avon. The application site, as outlined in red, comprises the dwelling of number 78 Tiddington Road and its residential curtilage. The site is located within the conservation area and is served by an existing vehicular access off Tiddington Road. The existing dwelling is located within a generous plot set back from the main public highway with mature soft planting along its front boundary. It is a traditional design being of pitched roof construction and finished in render and tile. Planning permission is sought for a replacement dwelling and associated detached outbuilding to the rear of the site. The dwelling would provide parking, gym and swimming pool at basement level with habitable accommodation at both ground and first floor levels. The proposed dwelling would be served by the existing vehicular access to the site. The application forms a resubmission of a, sc a scheme which committee previously refused and which was subsequently dismissed at appeal. This slide shows a comparison in the site plans with the proposed site plan at the top of the slide and previously refused site plan at the bottom of the slide. Members will note that the single story rear projection adjacent to the shared boundary with number 80A has been removed whilst the forward projecting garage has been enlarged. The width of the dwelling has also been reduced. The contemporary building would feature varying frontages and roof heights finished in light and dark brickwork. The pitched roofs would be finished with zinc whilst the flat roofed elements would be finished with green roofs. Here you can see the proposed front elevation at the top of the slide and the previously refused front elevation to the bottom of the slide. Similarly, the rear elevation is proposed at the top with the previously refused rear elevation at the bottom. And here are the proposed side elevations in the context of the previously refused scheme. The detached outbuilding located at the end of the garden would reflect the design of the replacement dwelling and would be used as a garden store. The architect has submitted this visualisation to give more of a flavour of the proposed dwelling. On this slide, you can see photos of the front and rear elevations of the existing dwelling. Looking down Tiddington Road in a southwesterly direction, the neighbouring property of number 80A can be seen on the left-hand side of the slide, 
with the side wall and front gables of the existing dwelling visible, visible through the trees and boundary planting. The existing dwelling and its associated vehicular access as viewed from the main public highway and looking down Tiddington Road in an easterly direction, the neighbouring property of number 76 can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide with the existing dwelling which occupies the application site behind the trees and boundary hedging. Members should note that there are a couple of updates as detailed on the update sheet. Chairman, the recommendation is to approve the application subject to conditions as detailed within the committee report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just on that particular point on the update sheet, um, one additional letter received from CPRE. I think you've um, addressed that particular item, have you? Yeah, so just to confirm, that was a point of clarification on their original comments, which are proceed in the committee report. Thank you very much. Okay, um, our first speaker is Peter Phillips. Phipps, I've, oh, it's even written down correctly. I didn't get it right. Mr. Phipps. <laughs> Uh, you have three minutes in your own time. Okay, thank you very much. Firstly, may I thank you for the site visit this afternoon. I'm also speaking on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas of 76 Tiddington Road. Um, unfortunately, they can't be here this evening. Um, right, three minutes. I need a fortnight. <coughs> Could put the image on, please, Alice. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, the images on the screen show the existing habitable house and the footprint of the existing and the proposed house. Two similar applications have been refused by this committee, the last one unanimously. An appeal has also been dismissed by the inspector on the grounds of mass, bulk, scale, and the significant harm to the heritage asset. The inspector stated the development would fail and uh, fail to preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area, and any such harm should be avoided. He noted that the appellants had promoted high-quality design as a public benefit. However, the inspector disagreed and said this did not outweigh the harm he had identified. He found the development conflicted with policy CS8. This new development is still significantly larger, visibly intrusive, and overbearing and dominant. The seven-metre-high flat roofs still remain. It again fails to reflect the character and the distinctiveness of the locality. Yes, the width has been reduced, the pool moved, and some pitch roofs introduced. But despite two meetings with the architect, the important concerns raised by the inspector, neighbours and the residents' association, also historic England, have been ignored. The case officer's decision to approve the application is subjective, with no real evidence, apart from her belief that it is high-quality design. However, these are the facts. The proposed dwelling goes 53 feet deeper into the rear garden than the existing. The basement garage is 6,500 square feet. 5,000 tons of soil will have to remove, be removed to accommodate this alone with the loss of trees. The ground floor area is 7,000 square feet. This is 91% bigger than the existing. The first floor area is 4,000 square feet, 111% bigger. The materials to be used are foreign. No other houses in the conservation area have these finishes. They are not in keeping with our conservation area. The roof is zinc. The garden store is 1,000 square feet and 13 feet high. This is no standard garden shed. At the last committee meeting, Councillor Kerridge asked for clarification on CS20C and the definition of not visibly intrusive. He asked whether the term applied only to the street scene or the neighbouring properties and their gardens. Richard Gardner, the planning manager, confirmed it applied equally to both. In short, the dwelling is significantly larger, extends 53 feet further into the rear garden and is visibly intrusive to us neighbours. It fails to preserve the character and it fails to preserve the character of the uh, conservation area and is contrary to the seconds, robust please. policies of CS8, CS9 and CS20. The Neighbourhood Development Plan policies H5 and BE11 and the NPPF. Why have planning laws and policies if they are not going to be adhered to? We urge you to refuse this application once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr Phipps, I think... You have got more slides. Did you want to show those? Um, yes, please, if I, uh, I... I may. This is a, a matrix of um, areas 
compared with the existing. Okay. But the, f the next slide, I'm if sorry. I may, shows the low level sun at the end of uh, November. It goes lower in December. We will lose this sunlight into our kitchen. You can just see the kitchen door handle on the, uh, the bottom right hand corner there. The uh, development, the 53 feet goes right past where the sun is and where you can see the washing line. So unfortunately, we'll lose that okay. should this development go ahead because it's so tall. I think, thank, thank you for clarification on those. Right. Um, members, Councillor Giles. Um, just want to ask you about materials because you've raised that. It's um, in the officer's report, um, just to deal with, for example, the brick, it said that that because it's a white brick and that the, the darker brick is on the side, that actually in some respects that even though it's obviously not identical material, it does, for example, reflect some of the white render that's visible on that street. What would you say about that? I agree with you, but they're not bricks. They're like, I believe, and I'm sure the architect will correct me if I'm wrong, they're more like slate and they're different colours. There's white render. Um, one of the gables is going to be dark black, which um, uh, the case officer has said in her report that they need to be looked at. And the roof is zinc. There's nothing in the conservation area, down Tintin Road, anything like that. It will be out of keeping. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. I didn't know whether I could have a street scene of, and then ask the question that the gentleman said he was being overlooking. I just thought if we had the street scene up, he could make a comment. We did have a street scene. We're just know. searching. Hold on. Any more? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, where are you overlooking in the respect of your overlooking? I will be on the left hand side. Of th that's, that's my house there. Yeah. And the, if you can see between the chink of the trees there, the yeah. white portion, from the ridge, it goes out 53 feet into the rear garden. We have a balcony um, for exiting our, our bedroom. So you are still a distance from the house, the same distance. You can ask that as a technical question yeah, if okay, you want. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine, you're right. Okay. No, no, right. it's okay. It's, it's just, just that obviously that's something that the officer can, yeah. yeah. Councillor Giles? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, the other thing I wanted to do with is this outbuilding at the bottom of the garden because essentially what the officer is saying is because it's, it's 40 metres, I think, from where the end, your property ends, essentially it's a sufficient distance away to not really be bothersome, even though it is a big building. What, what would you say about that? Well, I, I disagree with you there, unfortunately. It is. Um, 40 metres sounds a lot, but it, it isn't. It will be visibly intrusive, and it is four metres high with a three metre by three metre industrial door. It will be seen, I can assure you. I don't know if the officer's got, uh, I know that she took uh, some photographs. Oh, it's no garden shed at the end of the day. I mean. Right, um, any other questions, members? No? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You've turned the microphone off, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Right, thank you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Ollie Spicer and uh, Mike Dewhurst, the applicant. Again, you have three minutes in your own time. Um, before we start, would it be possible to put the slides on? Okay, thanks. Yeah, you can... Um, if I just kind of wave my hand up a bit. <laughs> it's, it's about five or six slides, if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, good evening. The application before you this evening is a result on the previous application being refused and dismissed as appeal. Although the appeal decision was disappointing at the time, it's been very positive and guiding the sorts in the revised proposals before you this evening. The appeal inspector was very clear in his report about the key issues that resulted in the dismissal and where not that the remaining areas were deemed acceptable. Three reasons were stated in the previous decision and we have strived to redesign this replacement dwelling so that these reasons can be overturned and are fully addressed. The officer's report states clearly in the council's professional opinion how this has been achieved. However, just for the clarity, I'd like to address a couple of these points. 
The first reason stated for refusal was an overbearing impact on the street scene due to its size and mass and the building's width being increased con constituting overdevelopment. We have reduced the proposed building to be narrower than the existing building on the site and is significantly lower than the existing dwelling. Now it's been repositioned, uh, if you just move on, sorry. Uh, now it's been repositioned um, centrally on the plot, creating the large green gaps between the neighbouring properties, far larger than the currently available and reviewed on today's site visit. The inspector's report noted the refused application building width and large flat roof nature filled the plot. This was a key issue in the effect on the street scene and we have been redesigning the roof structure, reduce the height and scale through the varied forms and create a building that is visually less impacting on the street scene. On the next slide, the slide illustrates existing dwelling at our initial application, the second one from the top. The third one down was the application which was refused at appeal and the bottom slide, uh, bottom image indicates the proposed dwelling as today with a red line being the existing dwelling and the green areas being that, that which are now created which have never been there before. Um, the, um, the next slide, if we move along, one uh, numerically demonstrates this reduction in impact and betterment of these proposals. The proposed dwelling will have a 22 square metre benefit, a numerical benefit over the existing house, let alone the previous refused application. By way of a further example of this reduced impact, the next slide um, on, has a comparison photo montage demonstrating the existing dwelling on the right hand side of the image and the proposed dwelling as montaged on the left hand side. The varied roof design, lowered ridge height, reduces the scale, provides a lighter receding appearance that visually reduces the bulk, as noted by the inspector in the, in the appeal statement. The two-storey and single-storey aspects of the proposed building are noted by the inspector as being acceptable in terms of impact on amenity, especially with number 80A, although the single-storey rear swimming pool, which is now being removed, 30 seconds, to please. impact um, addresses this area. If you move on to the next slide, um, the last three slides are examples of buildings that this committee has over the last few years granted permission to be constructed in and around Stratford in the conservation area. They're innovative and high quality architecture that are all demonstrations of this product. If we move on to the next image there, um, again there, and the final image. The final slide, uh, now under construction, is by a local firm. Design I'm Mitchell. afraid you've run out of time. Do you want to quickly summarise, please? Um, high quality architecture has a place by its inclusion in the historic core and the heritage of our town is appreciated more by its juxtaposition with modern and contemporary architecture of high quality. So I uh, urge you to support your officer this evening, if possible. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Members, are there any questions you'd like to ask? Councillor Barnes. Um, I was just, you've obviously, uh, I think I'd, I was here on committee when we refused the one before or whatever, which was obviously this is smaller. Have you spoken to anybody, like the town council or the board member or the neighbours? Or uh, yeah, we, we've um, so after the uh, appeal and the, um, that was dismissed by the inspector, we sat down with a, a kind of clean set of tracing paper, per se, with Councillor Rolf at the very initial stages. Um, all of the applications that have been put in so far have been wholly supported by the officers and been brought to committee through um, the consultation process uh, with. Councillor Rolf, the Town Council have never objected to any of the applications that have been put forward. We've always presented to them and have had no representations on all occasions. Um, we completely readdressed the scheme and Councillor Rolf was uh, supportive and pro pro progressive with us, especially with this latest set of information. The quad, the quad garage at the front, we, we initially were going to have... So you have had okay. communication? Uh, yeah, and also yeah. with the residents, local residents. Okay, thank we you. We haven't been able to appease all of the issues, but we okay. Can I just pick up a point? Um, Alice, do you have the uh, side looking from uh, number 80 and sort of that side elevation, please? That's the one there, isn't it? Is it the bottom top one? Yeah, that, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the one that will be um, extending from the new building into the garden? Is that the elevation, the top one there? Because I think, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the one that the um, neighbours complaining most about.
That's it, yeah. Main drilling, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. But I'm trying to get to, yeah. But do you feel, though, that because it's such a, a flat roof, and this is the criticism of the, by the neighbour, that that hasn't been addressed as regards the frontage? I see where you're coming from on that particular point. But the side, do you think you've addressed that issue? Any other questions? Council Giles and Council We've had various sort of measurements in terms of footprint. I'm just trying to get to, because CPRE basically talk about a, a roughly 200% increase in total footprint. And then we've obviously heard neighbours saying the ground floor is about 91% bigger on the ground floor. Are you able to give me some percentages of what the footprint is? So, um, the size of the house and the character of the area have been kind of juggled around quite a lot over the last couple of years. Um, an interesting analysis, if you like, if I say number 76, which is the lower plot here, um, its, foot, its dwelling footprint compared to its plot size is 15.1%. Number 80A, which is the house um, to the top, and interestingly was a house built in the large garden of the large house, um, has a footprint even so um, of 10.5%, uh, uh, so it's a smaller house and a smaller plot. Um, and the proposed dwelling, our dwelling, is 15% of its plot size. The footprint of that dwelling is 15% of the plot. So in, in character, its footprint is very similar to both the immediate neighbours and the rest of the road. What I'm asking, though, is what is the percentage increase in footprint between what exists on that plot and your proposal? It is just in, the, in terms of footprint, just under 50%. You can confirm that if you wish to with the officer at the technical question. Councillor Fielding. You rushed through the comparable, well, you had to rush through the comparable or modern buildings that you, you were showing on the slides. Are there any other buildings of a similar style along Tiddington Road? I know there are a lot of variable styles. If, uh, if I could ask Alice to put the slide back up, I'm sorry to uh, use your eye. Um, there is, a, there, there is one uh, lower down the uh, drive, uh, lower down the Tinton Road, uh, if you just go back and again. These are interesting. So the top left is a house on Welcome Road. It's a very <coughs> tree-lined conservation area. The top right is on Chestnut Walk around the corner, um, a listed building as well as a conservation area. The bottom right, as you can see there, is a house which is built at the bottom of Tinton Road. Uh, we, we designed it and, and uh, oversaw the build of it. Um, it is set back slightly from the front because it's an infill plot. Um, which is in the area, and it's interesting that it's covered in black zinc, and it's got black bricks on the base, nevertheless. If you go to the next slide, there are, um, uh, the top left hand is a, a, a modern pair of villas, and I don't know if you can pick up there, but the top entire halo roof is all clad in zinc. So you've got like a white rendered building with expressed eaves that are very light and thin, which are clad in zinc. Zinc is a modern material which is, um, has been raised. It's, it's a natural material, it isn't man-made, it comes out of the ground, it's a very you know, sustainable local material. Both of the, uh, the images on the right, the top right is in Alveston. Interestingly, the last time this application came to this committee... I'm few, more interested yeah. in Tiddington Road rather than... They're all, they're all within a few hundred metres of this site, so they are within the character. Um, all right, I think you've answered the question anyway. Thank you. Councillor Giles. So I just want to deal with the, the garden building. What, it's, it is large. What's the purpose of it? Um, this is the applicant, so I'm going to introduce him. This is Mike Dewhurst. Um, Mike is, uh, he runs a, a business which uh, makes um, all sorts of things, bikes for the Olympics, carbon fiber bits and pieces. Um, he collects cars, um, all sorts of old cars, new cars. Uh, so the reason we've designed the basement is to store cars. He's pride and joy that he collects there, that out of sight, away from the street. Um, so within the house, all the domestic paraphernalia won't be within that zone. So the garden store is a very large house. It's been designed to go in that area. So all the garden equipment, the children's equipment, we've got three young children. Um, so I can kind of hand you over, but on that basis. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, <coughs> not wanting to keep um, kids' bikes and canoes and all the paraphernalia that you acquire with children when they want to do their sporting activities and as they grow and develop, 
you need the, the, you can acquire a lot of a lot of uh, paraphernalia with them, and I wanted to keep it out of the way at the bottom of the garden, tucked away, really. Okay, thank you. As a, as a uh, architectural design point of view, on the site you'll see there, the the actual section of land is a very strange shape for the plot. The way the plots have been divided over the years, it's kind of like a, a triangular finger shape. So the building is slightly arbitrary. In fact, it's shaped like a wedge to fit in there. So because the land is kind of useless, yeah, I want us to make the most use of it as a reasonable building. I think we appreciate that. Thank you. Council Jar, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, members, are there any other questions of our speakers? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, our next speaker is Councillor Franchley. <laughs> Not so short this time, Councillor. Um, may I say that I was, as Councillor Rolf cannot be here, she's uh, away she actually asked me to read her words this evening which i will do okay <clears throat> here we are again this will be the third time an application has been brought forward for this plot you will have heard from the architect owner that he has taken on board all the comments made by you as a committee at the previous planning meetings and those comments made by the inspector if you haven't read the inspector's report i'd ask that you take some time out to read it fully. It's quite damning and very precise in its comments. The architect, I believe, has paid lip service to the inspector's report. He's removed the long building facing 80A and has made the house slightly smaller. However, it is still nearly three times bigger than the original house. And I must refer you to policy CS20, where it states that a replacement dwelling should not be visually intrusive and not significantly larger than the dwelling it replaces. This proposed house is 18 and a half thousand square feet with nearly six and a half thousand square feet underground, which will house the garaging and the swimming pool. This leaves nearly 12,000 square feet above ground. This is a massive house out of all proportion to the other houses along the Tiddington Road. He has taken note of the inspector's comments about the flat roof, but by doing this, he has cosmetically put in three pitched roofs at the front covered with silver zinc. These pitched roofs will be covered in zinc, which is a shiny colour, not appropriate within a conservation area and setting. If you look closely at the frontage, you will see a huge mass of flat roof behind these pictures, although the picture is slightly angled so that you don't see all of the flat roofing. This picture is very misleading. He has done this to make it look more housey and to overcome the concerns of the inspector, but all it is doing is hiding the mass and bulk and overbearingness of the two-storey flat roof building behind. This will have a huge impact on both neighbours as that is all they will see at the back. I'd like to draw your attention to the proposed garden store in the garden. This will be a thousand square feet single storey building and will be four metres high with a three metre shuttered door at the front. The size of this garden store is a similar size to most three bedroom houses which are being built around the town. This is rather large for a garden store, and I would suggest that it should require a separate planning application who has a garden store that big. This committee has refused the two previous applications on mass, bulk, overbearingness, and impact on street scene. It has also refused both previous applications of the failure to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. This has been backed up by the CPRE comments made by the CPRE on this application make no real change to previous comments. All the comments this committee has made on previous applications have been upheld by the inspector in his report. It is essential that you read the inspector's report in full before you make any decision. This proposed house is still significantly larger. It is still overbearing in mass and bulk of the flat roofs. It still does not enhance the street scene. It is still not appropriate design in a conservation area. The Tiddington Road Residents Association have met twice to determine this application and have voted unanimous, unanimously to object it on these grounds. I ask that you object this application for the above reasons. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, it's obviously a little unfair asking you to respond to questions uh, on behalf of Councillor uh, Rolf. I, I fear I don't have that detailed in-depth knowledge. No, I think she's covered the points that's, that's fine. I've picked up a few items that from what you've been saying, and I'm willing to ask those as technical questions, 
in a moment if that's okay with you. Okay? Thank you very much indeed, Councillor. Right, uh, technical questions. Um, first thing I would like to ask, well, there's two actually I'd like to ask. One is the zinc. Obviously, uh, we have seen zinc today, this evening. Um, in your opinion, do you think it will soften and sort of soften down over time to a sufficient level that it does not become obtrusive? My view is that it's, it's obviously a more contemporary material, but for that reason, I don't consider it to be automatically inappropriate in the conservation area. As you said, we picked up with it being used on the RSC theatre, which is a grade two star listed building within a conservation area setting. I did have um, a discussion with our conservation officer on this point, and he considered the use of zinc to be appropriate in this location. Although it's a conservation area, he considered that the zinc would work well and appear recessive to the lighter bricks used in the elevations on the dwelling. Okay, thank you. And the other one I just wanted to raise before I, uh, uh, other members jump in is um, we've always been looking at number 80 and the distance, the separation distances between the, uh, well, the, the patio area, the, the wall there, and the new, um, the area that to, to projects from the, the bulk of the house. Um, 76, have we done the same calculations there? And do you consider that to be... Um, better or worse than it was at the previous application, please? Uh, the impact would be improved by virtue of pulling it further away from this side boundary. Um, in the assessment of the last application, members were satisfied that previous concerns with the amenity on this courtyard area had been overcome with amendments reducing a forward projecting garage, which is over here. And similarly, so it wasn't refused on, on the impact on number 76. And similarly, the inspector carried that forward. Um, this is a swimming pool building here, so it has windows on all sides. And the separation distances between the two buildings is considered to be acceptable to retain an adequate level of amenity for that dwelling. And also the extension, um, the, the proposed sort of um, piece that it projects from the building, that's it, yeah. Similarly, because you've got windows on all three sides, any impact would not be significant. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lawton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've got two, if I may indulge you. Uh, is it possible for us to show a, a, a wider um, plan of the area, showing, I presume it's 80B? The, the reason I'm asking is the, 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 the plan we've got there, we've got the three garages, they're all pretty much the same, but the, the applicant site here, it, it, it seems to be not following the line of the road. It seems to be a four-bay garage where a three would sort of fit in, but if, if you look at the houses next door, does that, are you happy that it, it, the positioning of it, but certainly that garage is, is in line with the rest of the four houses? It doesn't look so when you look at 76, 78, and 80A. The difficulty with, with this map is it doesn't actually show the forward projecting garage on number 76. Yeah. If I just go back to this plan here. You, um, you, see, you see what I mean? It, it, yeah. It, it seems to be one bay too many. Yeah, I, 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 I can see the point. Uh, my view is that it's still an adequate setback from the public highway um, here. And obviously, forward projecting garages are very characteristic of Tiddington Road the whole way along. Um, my view is that that the impact of that is acceptable, but obviously it's for members to, to weigh that up in the assessment of the application. Okay, fine. And, and my second one, if you can keep on that and move your, uh, your cursor down to the, the, the two-story of it, keep going, down, down, stop. I can't see what that is. It looks like a big lounge area or a garden room. It's either my eyes or uh, the photocopier. <laughs> Let me just um, pull up the more detailed plans. <laughs> Thank you, So at first floor level in here, we've got a uh, master bedroom. And That's, that was my second question. So that is a, a, a lounge garden room, and above it is, is the master bedroom. It's a kitchen breakfast room at ground floor level oh, here, okay. and then a master bedroom above. Councilor Barnes. So I was just going to do... The, the, it's a big house on a big plot, but how much smaller is it now compared with what it was? And, and there was some thought that the distance between the neighbour had been reduced. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so I've got... Only checking the figures that were given by the applicant. 
Yeah, I've got, I've got a few of, of my own calculations in terms of sort of footprint. Um, so the existing dwelling ground floor level, so i.e. the footprint, equates to approximately 340 square metres. Um, the application which went to appeal and was uh, dismissed at appeal was approximately 880 square metres in floor area, so footprint, uh, footprint, not total floor area. And this current amendment is approximately 650 on footprint. So comparing the existing to proposed, we've got 340 square metres as existing, 650 as proposed. So it is, it is still larger than what's there. Can I just pick up on that point? We've heard various percentages, which is obviously one of the lovely things that people throw at us, is between 50 and 90 percent bigger. Um, do we have a percentage, just to, con just to clarify the percentage difference? I don't have a calculator on me, <laughs> so I can't do, but I mean, you're going from 340 to 650, so it's approximately doubling the size in terms of footprint. Next question I would ask then is, because a significant amount is below ground, does that, is that taken into account in your calculations? So that's the ground floor area only. Um, in terms of we're looking at total floor space, so across the basement grounds and first floor, we're looking at approximately 1,500 square metres for the dwelling as proposed. As existing, it's over the ground and first floor level, you're looking at approximately 520 square metres. Thank you. Any other questions? No, yeah, um, just to double check. Um, okay, open to debate. Councillor Giles, Councillor Field. I just wonder, because Councillor Rolfe has invited us to read the inspector's report, and bearing in mind its recency and, and how relevant it is, um, I, I know that that's, there's, there's potentially a logistical issue with it, but I, I do wonder whether it is, on reflection, important for members to read it. Well, just for reference... Um, I know bits are quoted within the report. Well, it was actually sent as an email to all committee members. Ah. I, well, I, I apologise, but I, and I know it's very, very inconvenient, but would I be allowed five minutes to read through that? Because I haven't seen it, um, which I, I appreciate. I should have read that before, but I, I think it's important that if... And if anyone else hasn't, I think they ought to as well. Um, members, I'm happy to um, suspend proceedings for five minutes or ten minutes for Councillor Giles and any others to have a read of the, uh, the inspector's report, please feel free. Uh, the promoting will be uh, suspended for, for about 10 minutes, okay?
opportunity to read the inspector's report as well. Okay? Thank you very much, everybody. If you can just uh, take your seats. Thank you. Right. Okay, then. Uh, as I started to say, we're open for debate. Councillor Fielding. I, looking at the plan of the proposed plan, it is a lot smaller, or it doesn't spread as far either way as the first one that went to, got dismissed at um, appeal. On the other hand, the two neighboring properties are very close to the boundary, so anybody who tries to develop something on this site, unless it's really very small and then it'll look ridiculous on the site, are going to come up against this problem of um, bound, the boundary and the neighborhood, the neighboring properties. And I think that in, although I don't like the, some of the materials used, I think that it's, it's in, reasonably in keeping with Tiddington Road, which is a somewhat unusual road with so, so many different designs and, on it. Thank you. Councillor Barnes and Councillor Kerry. Well, I, I did read the report some days ago, and I think the important thing has been taken out. The bulk and size has been reduced. It is a big house on a big plot. There are a lot of different sorts of houses down that road in the vicinity. Um, I think they've addressed the inspector's concern, although the ward member is, is still not happy. But um, looking at the reasons for refusal that we put forward before, I think, I think most of them have been addressed. I, I would sort of go along with the opposite. Councillor Kerridge. A uh, comment to start with. Uh, I very much like the old design, uh, and actually I very much like this design as well, but that's a personal matter. I think uh, the new design has addressed uh, the issues that were mentioned in the, the uh, appeal decision. Uh, and reduce the width and remove the swimming pool, which was mentioned in the appeal decision. In fact, I think they've listened very carefully to what was said in the re appeal report. And, and therefore, uh, I think it, I would, I would um, go along with the officer's uh, recommendation on this and um, recommend supporting it. Councillor Jones. Um, Yes, it's obviously certainly an improvement on the previous two proposals in the sense that, yes, it's um, narrower and it, it addresses leaving that gap between the properties. Um, however, that isn't the yardstick by which we should be judging the application. We need to judge it by what exists currently. And CS20 says that it shouldn't be significantly larger. I think there can't be any denying that this building is significantly larger than that which is currently there. Um, and I think the applicant's own, um, you know, it's clear from the measurements we've got a 50% larger footprint. However, you could say that on its own, given the plot sizes and what we're looking to do, maybe it would f sort of scrape over the line because, yes, it's significantly larger, but that's okay. It breaches CS20. I think the concern for me is that when you put that together with the fact that the, the, the design and the difference in design, um, the question of whether it enhances the, the, this area and in particular the fact that it's a conservation area, I think that's where it becomes problematic because I think you could have one of those things and it maybe be acceptable. So you could have a much smaller proposal with a design that's maybe not in keeping with the area and, and something a bit different, but it wouldn't be so noticeable. But I think when you put the breach of CS20 together with that design, which I don't think can be said, possibly said to be in keeping, I know there's that one at the bottom of Tiddington Row that is quite modern in design, but it's set back, it's very hidden. In fact, it's, you'd ha you have to search for it. It's not on the street front as such. And actually, the, even though there's a degree of eclectic design on Tiddington Road, it's not that eclectic. It's, it's post-war, there is an in-keeping style, and I think this will look very different. Now, that's not to say we can't do very different things in the district, but I think we have to be careful where we're doing that in a row of houses where that broadly there's a similar style of materials. And I think we have to be very, very careful 
where we're allowing something which is significantly larger will be very, very prominent, um, and it is very, very different. So I think, and for me, I am concerned about the materials. Clearly, they're infinitely preferable to the dark brick that, that was the previous proposal, because that, to me, that was very much not in keeping. But I have to say, I'm not particularly convinced by the argument that this light brick is going to look like render. I think it's going to look noticeably different. And, and that's fine. It's a noticeably different design. So for me, I think when I just weigh up the pros and the cons, I think it's those two concerns, pl placing them together, I think you're in real danger of having something which looks, it's too much. And it, 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 with the size and the design altogether, it, it's just, it's, it's not right. We should feel comfortable we should feel comfortable with what we're approving it should enhance we shouldn't have reservations um, you know there's a lot of scope to put something on this plot and we shouldn't be feeling is this a good idea and I don't feel I can go yeah waterside yeah you know great it works and there's modern bits and there's other modern things we've put in the district but I don't feel that I can just say yeah yeah I'm comfortable thank you I, I must admit I, I sort of transfer carriage I, I, I personally don't have a major problem with the design, especially the frontage. I'm not convinced that it enhance the street scene. And I think that was one of the arguments that was put forward by the inspector. Um, but I don't think it significantly detracts from it either. So in that respect, um, I'm not too concerned about the street scene side of things. I do feel that the, um, the modernistic design in its context, certainly from the front, looks fine and in that respect. I'm happy with that. But the side is very blocky again and flat roof, and I feel that that isn't as, as nice as it could be. Um, we do have some plot plans showing the um, sizes. And it is interesting, of course, we are now, actually now making a comparison between the original design, which was refused, and this one, which is smaller and uh, squeezed on the top, but it is still a significantly large, bulky building. Uh, and again, this is the this is the question that we we have to decide on: Is it still overbearing? Is it still, to its mass and bulk and scale, too big for this particular plot? Um, so I'm I'm not I'm not there yet on this. Uh, no. On the one hand, I, I agree with Councillor jo uh, Councillor Kerry, and then with Councillor Joe. I do have a Councillor Lawton first, but if you wish to just respond to that to one point because in you saying that it occurs to me that I think it, I think it is a fair criticism to say is this gabling ever so slightly cosmetic because actually it's interesting having that drawing up the flatness which I think is a, a, gen, a, a, a very genuine criticism of this design that flatness really it's covered up by a bit of cosmetic there and the question then is what is the impression to the neighbors of that and actually I think there is a I think there is a legitimate argument to say for the neighbors impression and that the visual intrusiveness for them because it's not just to do with the size it's about what it looks like that's visual actually is it going to look very flat and blocky from their from their perspective and I and I and I look at that and I think probably it is going to Councillor Lawton uh, thank you chair well again <laughs> design is design and, and it is a very personal thing I, I personally um, think this is a much much better elevation than that was previously proposed uh, it was almost industrial in, in its look but that's that's my view that I don't think that's an issue that, that, that is going to weigh heavily in my decision on this one uh, what I am concerned and I, I think it's been raised by, by councillor Charles is this is a very big building um, and whether it does breach our CS um, in that I, I would sort of counter that by saying quite a lot of it is underground uh, and we have had recent decisions by inspectors where underground basements are effectively not counted um, so, so that is a thing I have two things that worry me one is the garage at the bottom which at four meters high is pretty much an industrial unit not a garage and I would have thought that a building of three meters high would be more than sufficient to house lawn mowers and bicycles and uh, and what have you uh, but we have what we have at the moment um, and the second thing is I really think that the protrusion to the to the south of the site which is this large kitchen diner if that was a single story I'd be a lot happier but it's having the extra master bedroom on the top that worries me because I think that does affect the amenity of 80a um, I would love to see the master bedroom within the bulk of the building. It would reduce the size of the building. Um, that's where I am now, to be fair. 
I'm not quite sure whether those reasons are actually adequate planning reasons to turn this down. Um, these are personal views. Um, I'll have to think about it, Chair. Thank you. I think the, if you, it isn't an easy one, this one. I think the, the, con, the concern that's coming over to me, um, certainly from this side, is on the size of the bulk and the scale of it, of the, of the property, and whether that is an appropriate, um, not size, bulk and scale for this particular area. And uh, I think those are the issues that need to be considered. Um, can I just say on materials, it's a tricky one because we've seen today zinc, which is quite bright when it's new, does fade in time. And we've seen that today from the RSC. So I don't have a problem with that, that size of the materials. And I think they have the materials choice is far better than it was. So again, I, 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 again I'm still saying that in some many, many respects, I quite like the design. Uh, I just think the size of the scale is a bit of an issue to me. Councillor Barnes. Yeah, I wasn't sure, Mr. Chairman, has it, it been proposed? Or? Councillor Kerridge has proposed it. I'm quite happy to second it to move it forward. Okay, well, uh, we have a proposal and a second it. Are there any other people for debate? No? Okay then. Members, the, um, the vote before you is to grant planning permission for 17 slash 01474 slash 4. Uh, all those in favour? Chairman. Those against? Two, three against. This committee therefore resolves to grant planning permission for 17 slash 01474 slash 4. Thank you very much indeed. Two minute break to clear the room. Thank you. I tell you what, if I hadn't been on the site this day, I would have voted that now. When you look at the chap who spoke, his house is in fuck off and died. And it is far enough away. When you've got the picture of the midnight sun, you stand next to the beach coach, it's about it's two meters high. If you're really worried about the sun, then begin to your garden. You don't have to We, we've just had this dip with the hill. Oh, the 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 yeah, it was great when he's photographed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I completely agree with you there. Well, but we've, we've, had, we've had this decision on bulk on, on one of Kings Lane and some of our, the planning training on this. Because do you count the basement as space? Now, I yeah. tend to think that you do. But, but that the inspectors seem to be consistent. Yeah, but the 50% increase in property. Yeah, yeah. It, do, it doesn't fit our policy. Again, policy sometimes doesn't thank you very much. Um, our next item on the agenda, thank you very much, everybody. Our next item on the agenda is 17 slash 02667 slash Vary, which is Wixley Grange, Wixford. And Anthony is our presenting officer. Thank you, Chair. Um, the application before us this evening um, is for uh, relating to the. Um, holiday caravan site uh, on the south side of Wixford. Uh, members may recall um, in June um, that application was refused to remove the occupancy restriction to allow the caravans to be occupied for, for, for a full year. Um, that was refused. Uh, the application now is to um, retain an occupancy restriction but to limit that to one month, so reducing it by one month. So that's just a little bit of background. So here we have the, uh, the village and the black spot showing the position of the uh, caravan site. And then we have the caravan site, its location, moving on. Um, three horseshoes pub on the southeast side and the row, row of properties within the village. Haybrook running along here along the southern boundary which feeds into the River Arrow on the west side, just off the, uh, off the photograph to the west. Um, the main constraint on the site is the fact that the, 
Virtually the whole of the site is in zo uh, flood zone 3B, which is the functional floodplain. And advice from the Environment Agency is that um, the caravans were allowed um, on the basis of a, of a um, very, very well considered compromise. Um, if members will um, cast their minds back to when this was originally allowed, um, it, I'll just take you on a bit of a history tour here. Um, the, there was a certificate of, certificate of lawfulness for the site um, allowed for 50, 56 caravans originally, so it was a historic site. Um, the, we then had an application to reduce the number of caravans, but also to have five dwellings erected as part of the, the sort of deal, if you like. And um, careful consideration was given to the fact that the uh, caravan site is in a floodplain, and the, um, the Environment Agency con seriously considered um, the package of flood mitigation measures that uh, would allow them to hesitantly, I should say, move forward with, with allowing the caravan site. Um, and the position now of the Environment Agency is that um, having con seriously considered that package of um, mitigation, which included a um, restriction of two months, um, they feel um, that they're una unable to move on, on that compromise position, having seriously considered it before and feel that the um, additional month would um, introduce additional risk for occupants um, and on balance um, felt that that wasn't uh, something that they could support. So the recommendation is to refuse. Um, I don't really have a lot more to say, Chair. I think that really sums it up. Oh, yes, just a little procedural point. Um, if members decide to overturn the recommendation this evening, um, I'll just bring to members' attention that the application would have to be referred to the Secretary of State uh, to give him the opportunity to um, decide whether or not to, to call in the application. Um, so that's uh, just a procedural note. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Our first speaker this evening is Dean Morris, Co-Chairman of Wilkeswood Parish Council. You have three minutes in your own time. Here we go. Don't touch it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm learning. Um, the, the position of the Parish Council um, is that we support, um, we support the application, we supported the last application, uh, which would uh, have been even better for us than this one, but we support this one as well, uh, because this is ultimately better for the village in our view than the, uh, the default position, which is uh, the existing uh, 32 units uh, over a period of, t uh, over a period of, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, so the, the, the default position is 32 caravans for, um, for 10 months. Um, and obviously for a village, uh, we uh, would prefer that there were less caravans than more caravans for obvious reasons in terms of the, uh, the, the traffic uh, and disturbance. And obviously there are people bordering the, um, the, the park uh, and if we have a greater number of units used for holiday purposes, then the disturbance to the, uh, to, to the surrounding properties is greater. So per se, having less units is better for us. And that's one of the reasons we support it from 32 to 29. In terms of the extra month, um, uh, we, we, we would, uh, we, we think that the spin-off effect for us in that regard will be that we'll end up with less holiday makers and more owner occupiers uh, and for the village uh, to, to, to have um, not permanent residents but residents who are owner occupiers that are more permanently resident than transient holiday makers that come and go. So having that, the, the extra period is likely to encourage that type of owner 
which is an owner that we would prefer to have in the village than transient holiday makers that come and go uh, and may make a lot of noise when they're here, uh, etc. So uh, for, for those two principal reasons, we support it over the default position, which is the 32 over 10 months. Uh, we're, we're a little confused, really, in terms of the environment agency's objection. They haven't really – it's a sort of stick-their-finger-in-the-air approach. Uh, there's a trade-off between reducing the number of caravans and uh, reducing the risk by virtue of the lesser numbers, but uh, increasing the risk because you're adding a month occupancy. There seems to be rather an arbitrary uh, – 30 seconds, please. Uh, – rather an arbitrary approach to what's acceptable and what isn't. Uh, and in terms of the trade-off, uh, what are they saying is acceptable? If 29 units is not an acceptable reduction to them, then what is? Um, so uh, I don't think I can say a great deal more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've just got one question. Obviously, at the previous uh, application, which was refused, one of the major factors, if I remember correctly, and I may be corrected, is the fact that it's in flood zone 3B. Um, how do you sort of, uh, you know, what's your views on that particular aspect of the site? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know the, the full technicalities uh, because I'm not a flood expert. But as I understand it, part of the site it is, is within that zone. Um, I think there are, there are great, uh, as I understand it. Um, but, but our position is as a village I mean we've I've lived there for a long time and so I know how that manifests itself on the ground and the very worst it's manifested itself on the ground in my experience is about I think eight inches of water at one end of the caravan park um, was my last experience of seeing it on the ground um, and obviously all these caravans have got flotation devices and everything else um, so I accept that that, that the, the flood zone that it's in is, is the flood zone that it's in. It's demarked as such. Practically, I'm saying that, 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 that there are no significant manifestations of that, certainly to the occupancy of these caravans. Um, okay. and, and, uh, I just wanted to know what your particular views were on the, on the risk to the, the residents. That was it. My, my views are that the risk to 32 caravans over 10 months is not materially different to the risk over 29, over 11. That's my That's position. Fine. Thank you. Are there any other questions, members? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. You just press the microphone and as you leave. Thank you. Right, our next speaker is uh, Nick Allen and Andy Murphy. If Andy's... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And this is only time. for today, so you just got me for the, uh, for the three minutes. Thank you very much for um, giving us the time to speak. Um, I was here a few months ago when we went for 12 months. We've now put that back down to uh, 11 months, so it's going to be a holiday site. Um, I'll try and make this very short and sweet. Again, the biggest floods that we've seen in Stratford, April 98, July 1961, November 2012, and July 2007. That caravan park would be open all of those times. Um, we're looking for an extra one month, and it's, I find it a bit bizarre because it's something that the council have already done for other caravan parks in the area, and something that the council have already done for other parks in the area that are in flood zones too. And it's actually, uh, this committee um, actually supported an application that was in a flood zone of another caravan park. So Avonside and Welford went from 10 months to 11 months. That's in flood zone 3B. And also the Willows, Avid Salford, um, as I understand it, it was this committee that were asked to support it to 12 months. And they refused, they didn't refuse 12 months, they asked to be renegotiated. And in the end, um, the Willows got 11 months um, license. Both those parks are in um, the flood zone exactly the same as Wixford. Um, our problem is the, the Hay Brook at the end of the day. We are not actually on a river uh, like Avonside or the Willows. We're actually on a brook that does actually back up. And our problem is about 8 to 10 inches. Um, we think we run a, a, t a good tight uh, ship. We've got parks and stuff upon Avon. We are quite used to the floods, and we've done our utmost to um, put all the procedures in we can to make sure that the uh, holiday homeowners and our caravans are safe. And we do run a, a tight ship of getting people off if and when we have to. Um, 
hopefully you'll be able to support this application. As you've been told already by um, the council, this won't be the last. It'll have to go to the Secretary of State for it to be looked at again. But I do hope you can um, support this application for 11 months. Thank you. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? Well, just one, obviously, you mentioned about the Haybrook. Um, when you were here before, there was talk about the, that brook in itself and the fact that um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, again, memory, that to mitigate the flooding issues, that brook would need to be cleared and uh, made it to flow more freely. Has anything happened on that? We do clear it out, and we have cleared it out a lot more than it was. Okay, I'm not sure that answers the question, but yes, okay. So no, you have, have actually yeah, it maintained has, it, it. It has maintained since, I think, in the, last three, in the last three months, we have actually had the diggers in to, um, to maintain it and take stuff out of it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, members? Councillor Barnes. I was just trying to ascertain why you reduced the number and increased the length of time. Uh, we reduced the number increased the length of time, trying to give uh, the Environment Agency a, uh, a, a gain at the end of the day. There's going to be less um, days where, where people are affected by Absolutely. the flood because of it. So that's why we've done the, the, the less numbers and um, the extra month. Okay, thank you very much. Right, Councillor Adams is speaking on this one. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr Chairman. Um, I support the Parish Council with their comments that the reduction in the number of caravans can only be of benefit to the overall site and village and that by increasing the occupancy to 11 months, we'll probably encourage more re permanent residents and hopefully they will get involved in village life rather than just um, being holiday occupancy. Um, I realise that the environmental, environmental agency have concerns, but I think the last big flood was in July 2007, and of course that wasn't in the winter months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions of our Councillor? No? Thank you very much. Right, technical questions. Um, obviously the first one is the flooding element of this. Um, and the EA's response. Could you just quickly go over that again, please, Ante? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the, the EA wrote um, their response. Um, and as I was saying to you before, they have considered the um, reduction by three units, um, but, but consider, I'm just reading here, they said virtually the whole site is within functional floodplain zone 3B. And our position is that the site being at risk for an extra month of the year compared to the capacity of the site, if, fully, if full, uh, being slightly reduced, does not cancel each other out. So despite the offer, I think the Environment Agency's conclusion is that the extra month introduces extra risk um, and that isn't, that isn't sort of mitigated any further compared to what, what was um, proposed before and therefore their position is to draw that line in the sand and say that was our compromise position and that's as far as we'll go. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Any other technical questions? No? Okay, open to debate. Councillor Charles. Um, the Environment Agency have given this council professional advice about what they think is appropriate risk mitigation and they're very clear that they consider the 10 months is necessary risk mitigation to allow um, occupation on this site to exist given it's in a floodplain um, and that makes sense in many ways um, to me so um, I would be supporting the recommendation to refuse the variation of condition Councillor Barnes well um, I have a number of these sites right by the river this is I do know the site I was the county councillor when it did flood it floods down the fields stops at the road and then it's backflow here. Um, one minute they're saying no, next minute they're saying yes. Some even right by the river, they've given a lad for four, uh, 12 months of the year as long as they're on stands. So um, as far as I'm concerned, knowing the site, normally it doesn't flood 
when the people aren't there. Laugh as you may, the point is that you, you usually, usually it's in sort of August or September when we get floods, not in the winter when we get a lot of water because the water can then be controlled. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I would be happy to go along with the parish council. Um, and and uh, that's my personal view because, as I say, all the way along the river, and this isn't along the river, they make different decisions at different places and I can't understand where they're coming from. Okay. I, I, just to respond to that particular point, um, it is interesting that actually quite a number of floods have occurred in July. It's one of the big big flood periods in this country but I'll just and that's uh, where all the holiday makers are that's correct the point that's is really there. that we need a good warning system and that's the important thing the, the normally they, they don't you. allow them just after Christmas well that's the time when the water is we don't get the rain thank you the question uh, the thing is that uh, I'll, I'll, to be honest with you, I'd like to support this I really would like to support it I, I feel that this is a, it's a good site in fact uh, having listened to the PC about this, the, um, the argument they put forward for, for permanent residency on there is, is quite strong, and I, I get that, all of it as well. I don't feel that um, I'm happy enough yet to say that the, the brook, for example, has been, um, should we say, cleared sufficiently or modified in some form to actually reduce the flooding risk there. And I should say, I used to go to school past this side, plus the three horseshoes, and I've actually seen it flooded up to a metre there. So I do know it can flood in that particular area. Now, I'm not saying that things haven't happened over the, over the period. I would like to support this, but at this moment, I can't go against the EEA. And I, I do that because I've seen the effects of flooding. I live next to a river, and so I, 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 would, I can't support... Um, well, I, I will support, sorry, the officer's recommendation on this one. Councillor Giles. I just want to deal with Councillor Barnes's point about I can't understand why different decisions are made in different parts of the district. Well, that's because he's not a qualified member of the Environment Agency. Of course, there's going to be different considerations for different sites. They have different, they have different levels of the land. All sorts of different considerations apply. And that's why we ask for an expert risk assessment from an expert body about what is appropriate flood mitigation risk. It's, it's really quite simple. And I don't... I, I, I just... I find that a, quite a fast, um, I don't mean to be personal, but I do find that quite a facile comment because I don't think it's appropriate to sort of bring anecdotal evidence in in that way because I think okay. we employ these people to, to Thank do a you job. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, uh, in the respect that the brook there, if it's clear down to the arrow, there isn't a problem. Most of the problem on that particular site is trees. It, it is only a brook, that's why it floods because it's backflow. Right, Councillor Kerridge, I do apologise, I missed you out there. No, you're all having such fun. <laughs> I'd just like the second one as proposal to go with this. Councillor Lawton. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the Parish Council and, and the Ward Member here. I, I completely get the point that a reduction in the amount of caravans and again, I, I would be very happy to support 12 months of the year here to actually have permanence. Um, I think the thing that's swaying me here is, is, is the line here. Um, in this application, there is no further work or mitigation measures are proposed as part of this application. And I would have thought if the applicant came back with proposals to mitigate the flooding, whether that is putting permanent units on stilts, even though there might be a metre above, we, we all know of caravan parks, certainly they're in my ward, where as closer to the river, they, they are raised up. I mean, if that came back, I think everybody would be happy, but I'm not going to uh, go against the officer's recommendation because of that reason. Um, Councillor General, did you propose on that one? I didn't, but I'm happy to propose. Um... Okay, and Councillor Kerridge, you are, are you willing to second on that? Uh, members, the vote before is to refuse planning permission for 17 slash 02667 slash vary. All those in favour? Five, Chairman. Against? Abstain. Two abstentions. Thank you. This committee therefore resolves to, to uh, refuse planning permission for 17 slash 02667 slash vary. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is 17 slash 02558 slash vary. 
and that is the Ridge Langley Road, Cloverdon. The presenting officer is Amy. Thank you, Chairman. The application site to notify the black dot is within the southern part of Claverdon, a local service village within the West Midlands Greenbelt. The site edged red is situated south of Langley Road with residential dwellings to the east and west and open countryside to the south and a public right of way. Planning permission was approved in August 2017 for a replacement dwelling with integral garage and associated works. Permission is sought to vary the access arrangements for the site from a singular access point off Langley Road to include a second access point to create an in-out access arrangement. The second access would be sited northeast of the existing access point. So this is the existing and this is the additional access point which is proposed. The aerial photo shows the relationship of the application site in relation to neighbouring properties. There are examples of in-out driveways within the immediate street scene to the west, just here. So the top left image shows the site's existing access and is looking in a northeasterly direction towards the siting of the proposed new access, which will be positioned approximately in the location of the top right image, which looks in a southwesterly direction. The bottom image is an internal photo of the site. No additional trees would be lost other than those detailed within the original application. I will now show you a short video of this part of Langley Road. Bear with me a moment. Okay, if I just pause it here a moment. You will see um, a white car in the distance and this access which is um, viewable now. These are both the access points which serve the adjoining dwelling um, to the application site known as the field fieldings. Moving in a northeasterly direction towards the application site, just wait while the video catches up, you will see the current access for the application site and then as the video moves on, you will see where the proposed new access will go. I'll just go back a minute so you can just see the course. Here we go. So the new access will be positioned um, around about the point where my cursor is now. Bear with me. Um, so this slide shows existing boundary treatments um, used at properties adjacent to the site and as you can see a mix of soft and hard treatments are used. Chairman, the recommendation is to grant the application subject to the reasons as detailed within the committee report and just to make you aware there is a little update which I did mention um, that just clarifies that no additional trees will be lost as a result of the new access. Thank you Amy. Our first speaker is Councillor Lawton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Eamon, if you... Oh, you've already done it. Thank you very much. Um, the reason that Claverton Parish Council have, have forced this to committee is very simple. Uh, on the uh, drawing to the, to the left up there, we were quite happy with that. There are a number of houses, the fieldings, whatever, that have been developed. We, there's no problem with it. But we did think that because the existing house only had a single access, whereas the fieldings that the, the, the officers member did have double dual access or whatever, we insisted that they change the plans, and they did. And they came back with the plan on the left, and we were all happy with it. We didn't object. And then, well, this was in August, so we're now in September, October. Along came another plan showing the dual access. The parish council feels that this is incredibly unneighbourly because they had actually agreed a single access with the neighbours, and more, more, more further afield, some of the uh, 
occupants, certainly on the corner of Langley Road and Church Road here, um, they feel it as an intrusion. That is a very, very long-established hedge, and I do take the point that there are several multi-million pound houses there with dual accesses. But when you look at the one on the left, there's plenty of room to turn a car around. You don't need to swing in and sweep out. And this is the only reason we've got. There's no need for a second access. It's a shame to disturb a long line of, of existing hedge. And the residential amenity is, is going to be affected. Whether you consider that to be a planning reason, I don't know. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I just um, ascertain what the planning reasons were for refusal by the first time round? For the first time round, we, we, we made a request. Uh, we made a request because the neighbours asked us to, and the applicant at the time changed their plans. There was no argument about it, um, as far as I can recall. And the second revised, they came and talked to the parish council, said we're going to do this. We said, fine, the only thing we want to maintain is the hedge any, we don't want any trees removed, and uh, we'll keep a single access. They said yes. We didn't object to the first application. We're objecting to the second because they've just come along, changed their minds, thinking it'll be an easy deal, and uh, without scant regard to the, the, the wishes of the neighbours. Okay. I, I... So I think in planning terms, that we, 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 we're struggling, um, but we are coming up with... The, 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 well, well, I'll ask a few technical questions. Residential just... amenity. Okay, interesting. I shall ask some and streets, and street scene, sorry. I've okay. written that I shall ask well. the questions, obviously, of, at the street scene of, of the officer in the moment on technical questions. Thank you. Um, right, thank you for that. Uh, any other questions of Councillor Lawton? Um, no, okay. I shall now ask some technical questions. Any questions? The uh, first one I'd like to ask is um, I noticed on the um, your video, which is very good, there's a sign post. I assume it's a 30 mile an hour sign post. Is there an issue with that? And co related with that, are there any issues with visibility displays on here with this uh, second ex entrance? Referring to um, the potential visibility issues, um, highways have assessed the application and they've raised no objections. Um, they've only requested that if um, members are minded to approve permission, that um, there is a condition to control the direction that the gates swing onto the highway. Um, with regards to the 30 mile an hour sign, um, I d I can't, I can't foresee that um, it would create an issue. Um, highways haven't raised it within their comments, um, so presumably it's something maybe where the sign um, could, if it was going to be an issue, just maybe be relocated. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one on this. Um, permitted development rights on this property, are they still there, and could they do this under permitted development, just out of interest? Um, so the... The 2017 permission, um, which um, was approved earlier this year, the applicants haven't implemented that permission yet. So with regards to permitted development right, the current property has its permitted development rights intact. I had a conversation with um, a highways officer earlier this week who confirmed that Langley Road is um, a D road, which is unclassified. Um, so under permitted development um, the access could be constructed in the current form of the current dwelling um, prior to the seven, prior to no imp implementation of the 17 permission that already exists. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kerridge. That's key, really, isn't it? Um, so you're saying they could just do it now. I thought we'd finished all that. I thought that now you, you, you couldn't sort of do something on an old property which contributed to the new property because you end up with a property different to the one with permission you've got. So they put a, if they put a new access in now before they start building, what they end up is is something on the right which they haven't got planning permission for. Would that, would that be acceptable? I think for clarification purposes, yes, they could um, 
they could use their existing permitted development rights to construct an access, an in and out access arrangement in, in our assessment. Obviously, when it came to implementing the planning permission, what they don't have then is um, plans and a layout which then accords with the, with the consented drawings. Um, I think the position that, that the case offer has taken is we have felt it appropriate to assess the fallback, effectively the fallback position, which would be as it currently stands. They could provide an in-out in access now. And to finally clarify that, hopefully, they could provide an in-out access now, but if they wanted to build out, they'd have to block it up again. They wouldn't be in compliance with, they, they wouldn't be in accordance with the approved plans because the approved plans show a single, single access point. Okay, that'll do me. Thanks. Complicated. Okay, any other questions? Debate. Well, um, if uh, Councillor Lawton's chronology is correct, it would indicate that there is a rather cynical aspect to this application in, insofar as you ask for the support in exchange for a compromise and then dispense with that compromise at a later date. So it's, it's, it is, I think, unable is quite a good word for that, if that is the case. And we haven't been able to question the uh, applicant as a, to the necessity of this. However, um, I think it's also fair to say that any destruction of hedge creating a bigger gap which makes you look at, a, you know, see more of the property in what is a very rural uh, area, rural type of road, causes some harm. I think the question is whether it's an, an acceptable level of harm and I think bearing in mind there are double accesses along that road, um, it's difficult to say that that crosses the threshold to say that it's an unacceptable level of harm. So. Um, with some reluctance, I have to say, I would um, be minded to support the officer's recommendation. I think Councillor Kerry, then Councillor Fielding. Yeah, I, I think your, your unneighbourliness argument is fine, and although it's not specifically mentioned in, in the uh, in, uh, NPPF, it, there's, a, there's kind of a clause on consultation with, with the, the neighbours in the community, which this absolutely flies in the face of. So. I think you could use the NPPF's comments on consultation and stuff like that as, as, as an argument. Uh, the original plan was, was approved by, by the parish specifically because of this consultation. Uh, we're not just looking at an, a, drive, a new drive for it. We're looking at a, a, com, you know, a completely new application. In, in that case. It's not just an application for a driveway. So we, I haven't heard the, well, I may have heard the application for the original house, but I can't remember it. So, so I'm not looking at that. I, I think it's fair to assume that this, this new addition could be the straw that broke the camel's back in not accepting the original application. So I don't see why we should accept it now. Uh, and I would use, what is it? Are you going to tell me landscape? What number is that? There's, there's all sorts of... Um, CS5 refers to landscape and CS9 refers to... CS5, landscape, exactly. I mean, there's lots in there. Uh, proposals have regard to the local distinctiveness of the districts... Okay, that's not right. Uh, measures are incorporated into the development scheme to enhance and restore the landscape character of the locality. And this is exactly the opposite of that. It's taking away a hedge, which is part of the... Uh, the character of the locality. Um, new landscaping proposals are incorporated to reduce predicted harmful visual impacts. Again, this is exactly the opposite of that. So this is the opposite of what our policies recommend. Small harm though it may be, it is harm. There's no need for it. So I would uh, go against officers in this case and uh, recommend refusal. Councillor Fielding first and then Councillor Charles. We had a precedent in one of the villages where I was parish chairman, um, where a house wanted to put a driveway in, uh, as with other houses, on, uh, the, went to highways to try and prevent it happening. We went to the planning. On the grounds that it was unclassified road, um, we were unable to stop the driveway being created. So it, I think it's a difficult one, because this is an unclassified road. You're going across highways land, I would think, 
Um, and, okay, you're going to knock a hole in the hedge, which is what these people did in the village. So there is precedent of this sort of thing happening with our planning commission. Councillor Charles. I should have probably asked these as technical questions, but it has just occurred to me. Um, obviously, this is green belt, is it? So, cause, because sometimes um, we see in our recommendations that where the hard standing is increased within the site, that, that is felt to be an unacceptable impact on the green belt. Why was that not considered to be the case here? Okay, within my officer's report, um, I'll just read you a paragraph. Um, so, the um, driveway access and additional hard standing area is considered an engineering opera operation which is not considered inappropriate development within the Greenbelt, um, provide, provided the openness is preserved. So, um, within the NPPF, um, and engineering operations are considered appropriate, so that's, that's the reasoning. Ah, so, it falls under one of the exceptions, right? Okay. Correct. I'm just going to get Karen to clarify PD rights because I, I did raise that and I didn't think we could completely, my, my head won't get completely. Um, rather than referring you to the existing position, um, referring back to the, plan, the original planning permission for this development, um, obviously this is a variation so we would re be replicating the appropriate conditions in the new, in the variation permission. Um, permitted development rights were restricted on classes A to E. Now, so the previous position. Those didn't include a restriction on new, on accesses into the site. So potentially, theoretically, once the house is constructed um, and occupied, permitted development rights would then a court would then apply to this to, to, for the owners. Um, and my view is, in fact, at that point, they could actually utilise their permitted development rights to put in a driveway. I don't know if so Ross we, wants we to come back on that. We didn't take away the PD rights for putting in access, an access point. Um, hold on a oh, yes. Yeah, if the relevant permitted development right wasn't taken away from the existing permission, then, then, then the driveway could be constructed pursuant to permitted development rights anyway, I think is what Karen's saying. So are we saying they can put it in anyway? Well, I wasn't happy with it, but if they can put it in anyway, I can't do much about it, can I? I have to abstain. If I can just clarify, the permitted development rights only only apply once the property is completed and occupied. Okay, I think I think the way I'm reading this one is quite quite interesting, isn't it? For for what is on the f surface of it, a relatively small thing. Um, my view is that there's a certain amount of nose out uh, uh, nose out to joint on this particular one by the parish, and I get that. After all, they they did talk to the. Uh, the applicants and they thought they had an agreement and then they came back with another one but we have seen that in the past and we've seen it many many times in, in the past on the other hand I am struggling to see a reason to refuse it and I think we're trying to make up spurious reasons to be honest with you there is no real reason to refuse this and that's from a planning position perspective now the thing also is that if the PD rights are there and one form or another, and it's still complicated as far as I'm concerned, then I think that's just going to happen anyway. So reluctantly, I am going to support the officer's uh, recommendations on this one. Well, I'm happy to propose that. Um, Councillor Fielding. I'll second it on the ground that all we're doing is putting off the inevitable. <laughs> it's okay, it's a fair comment. Um, I have a proposal and I have a second. Uh, uh, members, the vote before you is to grant planning permission for 17 slash 02558 slash vary. All those in favour? Five, Chairman. Against? Abstain.
one abstention. Thank you. This committee therefore resolves to grant plan provision for 70 slash 02558 slash ferry. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Ulster Members Club and I will be standing down as will Councillor Payne. Thank you. Uh, right, councillors, uh, this is, uh, the next item is item 17, oblique 01133, oblique full. It is the Ulster Members Club at St. Faith's Road in Ulster. Um, we have a presentation, I think, um, from Eddie Wrench. Eddie, after you. Thank you, Chair. The site is located within the built-up area boundary of Ulster, just to the northeast of the town centre across the River Arrow as denoted here by the black dot in the centre. The site is currently a working men's club set to the southern edge of the Conway residential estate, uh, which is to the north. This is an aerial photo of the site showing the surrounding built form and uses. This is the existing uh, floor plan, uh, which shows concert hall area here, lounge, to this area and then the pub part to this area. The proposal is to retain the pub area, a bar area, sorry, in this area here and then convert the lounge and concert hall areas to a bed and breakfast. Uh, as part of that there would be a mezzanine floor um, inserted for additional bedroom space in the current concert hall area. This slide shows the existing and proposed elevations, uh, mainly with uh, fenestration changes, so smaller window types uh, replaced, um, some renewing of render, and also an um, emergency um, stairwell also inserted for the proposed mezzanine level. This is the proposed site plan. Um, the proposal includes an extension of the, um, of the car parking area into this area to the rear of the building. Also as part of the plans, um, there's boundary treatment improvements to the boundaries, specifically to the ones adjacent to the road, so there would be trees inserted and landscaping around the periphery of the site. And this is a current view of the site from the corner junction. Um, it's at the moment, it's all car park to the front and quite a stark, hard surface up to the front. Um, as currently part of the proposal, um, works have started, although they aren't working at the moment, but as you can see here, some of the windows have been inserted. Chairman, the recommendation is to grant permission subject to the five conditions outlined on page 30. Uh, and the update sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Um, our, uh, we have nobody here from the parish council, or, or certainly not on my sheet, so our first, second speaker, our first speaker is uh, Mrs. S. Adams as a resident, as opposed to a councillor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm speaking as a resident of the Conway Estate where the premises for this application are situated. 
I am objecting as a major part of this work has been completed and so the application is part retrospective and I feel that residents didn't have the opportunity and were not consulted prior to the work commencing. <clears throat> residents that had booked the community hall were told back in March that the club were not going to honour bookings made for July this year so this change must have been planned way back. I haven't seen any proven need for this type of accommodation in the town. Three years ago, a small hotel closed because of lack of use and was converted into flats. And this year, a bed and breakfast property in the town centre ceased trading and that also has been converted into two dwellings. At present, we have a travel lodge with 66 letting rooms, the King's Court Hotel with 61 rooms, and the Swan Hotel with eight rooms. I feel Ulster is adequately covered with bed and breakfast accommodation, and we do not need to promote visitors' accommodation for tourists. The report does say, under the principle of development AS2 of the core strategy, that the developers are expected to contribute to the achievement of these principles where it is appropriate. And B2, as quoted, improve indoor recreation and leisure facilities in the town when in fact we are losing a large community room. Ulster is lacking in community facilities since the closure of the Gregg Centre. Originally, seven Trent's, seven Trent's comments were that details of the drainage plans should be submitted prior to work commencing. Too late, the work has started and gone a long way. I have concerns over the parking site allocated with 31 rooms plus the manager's accommodation. It leaves few spaces for patrons. Also, if this application is successful, I would like to see a sympathetic lighting scheme so it doesn't impact on neighbouring properties, especially Oversley House, which are retirement flats in a Grade 2 listed building. I also have concerns over noise, but I see from the report that the submitted planning statement said it, that it's, it, it's the intention of the owners to have an earlier closing time for the bar. And this, of course, will come up when the seconds. applicant applies to vary the alcohol licence, which they have to do due to the alteration of the premises. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Very timely. Um, Councillor. Um, I appreciate your concerns about the potential retrospective nature of, or part retrospective nature of it, but do you not see a, some benefit here in terms of re rejuvenating this? Because obviously there is some evidence that this potentially struggles as a, to, to become as a viable business. And actually, if this is turned into accommodation, and it might be accommodation that's, for example, more affordable to construction workers or whatever, you then bring back into life that as a, a bar and a pub and, and, and increase its viability and presence. Um, I agree that perhaps, you know, the building does need rejuvenating, and perhaps the business does, does too, but to 31 one-bedroom accommodation. No, I don't think it's a good thing for the town or the um, Conway estate. Yeah, just say in the report that the town council find that at the moment it's not viable, but it could be with this application. Um, have you got any comment to make on that? It says, um, it says that the town council said at the present time the working men's club or whatever you like to call it, members club, is not viable. This is, a, from what I can gather from the application, a way of keeping the club still there but not using all of it. Well, councillor, I can't see where we're going to get um, patro um, you know, people to come to stay in this accommodation. I mean, we've heard that it's going to be for tourists as far as Eddie's concerned. I've heard it's going to be for builders. Um, you know, I just can't see that, um, you know, it'll be successful as um, a 31-bedded bed and breakfast accommodation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, if, if I may, again, I, I, I'm noticing that also the town council who did object um, went and saw We Only Working Men's Club and were obviously... Uh, unimpressed or impressed, I don't know what it is, to say, well, there are very similar sort of operations, and they actually uh, 
re re took their objection away because of that. Have you, have you got any comments on that? Um, yes. <clears throat> yes, the um, town council, some of the town councillors, the planning committee, went on um, a site visit to Wheelie Castle, which is in Birmingham. Um, and Wheelie Castle is a different animal to a market town in Warwickshire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fielding. In the site visits that we, we did this afternoon, we visited a hotel that needed to expand to create more bedroom space. And the indications I got is that there is a demand for hotels and hotel space within the district. Uh, I appreciate the type of occupant may not be of the exclusive nature, but on the other hand, it is a working man's club and it provides probably very good bed and breakfast for working community who are transient at the best of times. Is, is, surely that is something that you should offer uh, in the area. Uh, um, was, that, was that a question? Is that a question? Uh, well, it, I think that was a comment, not a question. Um, councillors, any, any other questions? No? Oh. <laughs> you talked about lighting. Have you got any specific um, lighting issues that you would want to be addressed? Is it that you would just want this lighting scheme to be sensitive given the proximity of the listed building and residential? Or have you got any other specific requests in relation to the lighting? Um, no, I haven't got any specific requests. Thank you. So. Our next speakers, were well, two speakers actually, uh, are, are the applicants and supporters, uh, Andy Wilkins and Karen Stevens. You have three minutes. Good evening and thank you, Chair and members, for the opportunity of addressing you tonight. Karen is with me, should you have any queries with, with regard to the operation of the club. This application provides a much needed investment to a members club located in the Conway and Ten Acre housing estate, which is the most deprived ward in the district. It proposes the loss of a function room being replaced by 31 bed and breakfast rooms. Over the past three decades, over 50% of clubs such as this, as, as this have been closed. This change will ensure that members club, this members club's longevity for what a very different time to those when members clubs like this were economic and viable. It is against this backdrop that operations like this need to adapt and to change or to face the consequences. 119 members have signed a petition supporting this application as they believe and support the diversification of the club and the benefits that this will bring to this important community facility. Admittedly, this application didn't start off on the best footing. There had been a lack of local consultation, and the owner, a publican, commenced some initial preparatory works before a planning decision had been made. He then consulted me about these issues. Work stopped immediately, and we sought to consult proactively with the town council. We attended a town council meeting together, and Paul apologised for commencing works whilst also explaining the reasoning behind the application and investment that he wanted to make. Town Council members accepted his offer of a visit to a comparable operation that he runs at Wheelie Working Men's Club. Here it was evident to see the difficulties that clubs like this face today and how they can be similarly adapted, yet still provide an important community facility. In addition to this, a request was made about improvements to the external landscaping. These were then incorporated and subsequently the Town Council removed their objection. 31 affordable overnight rooms are being proposed, run by a professional outfit for the loss of a function room that never really successfully functioned. There are not many locations where Stratford can offer reasonably priced accommodation, be it for tourists or for people working in and around the district. Karen can provide details with regards to the anticipated uh, occupiers. This application is about ensuring that this community facility remains a sustainable enterprise, employing people and maintaining an important contribution to the area. Members, as your officer identifies in his report, this proposal fits four square with your core strategy and we support your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I presume that, uh, uh, Karen, you would be prepared to answer any questions. Uh, any questions? Councillor Fielding. 
What market research have you done with regards to the bed and breakfast? We've successfully turned working men clubs round. Um, they, historically, they were very, very viable businesses. Um, and times have changed where the communities don't use them like they did. So if this was successful, this would be our fourth working men club that we've turned into bed and breakfast. Um, the one I'd make more comparison comparison with is the Faisley, which is a market town just on the outskirts of Staffordshire, uh, where we've done 24 bedrooms there. Um, that club was struggling very badly. It was doing about £4,000 a week, where we've managed to take it up to make it viable as a business. Um, the majority of people that use the bedrooms are through bookings.com. Um, you're quite right, a lot of them are white van men. Um, lots of families that are travelling because they're affordable. It means that there's a hot food offer, which is an amenity not only to the people that are staying, but an amenity to the community. It increases um, the footfall of people that we employ in them, but obviously the footfall that goes through. And I took um, a number of members from Alcester over to Wheelie Castle so that they could see that. And I also took them to the Faisley, which for me is more of a comparison. Um, and they got to talk to the people in there. And I think really that was what changed people's perspective of what we wanted to do. Uh, okay, thank you. I think, I think you've, you've answered the question and made the, the, the economic case. Thank you. Um, Councillor Barnes. Two questions, I think, really. Uh, was I correct in saying you said there was a petition that supported it? The members, or was that the members, was it? It was members. The sir. members, yes. Yeah. The, the other thing was, uh, what sort of people, are we, is this a tourist bed and breakfast thing, or...? Well, the majority of our bookings come through booking.com. Um, there are a lot, I can only talk on history in my other units. A lot of the people are workmen, tourists, families coming to the area. So they will be able to drink in the club and then get a bed lodged? Yes, they will. Yeah, and yeah, eat. Okay. yeah and, and a supplementary to that, if I, if I may. So the intention here is to keep the, the, the bar open as a, as a sort of bar during the day in the evenings and then from seven o'clock or whatever until nine it, it becomes a, a breakfast bar. Yes, that's correct. That's it, okay. And then, that you, you... <laughs> Councillor Fielding, I hope feel a question. Will the, will the bar be serving food for, or do you serve food at the present moment for people who, you, who use the bar or is that um, something that would have to happen if it was B&B? Food isn't served at the moment except to the teams. We've got lots of teams that use that and we do food for the teams. Um, breakfast will be served from 7am and food will be there all day and on the evening as well. And obviously we'll be doing Sunday lunches for the local community as well as the people that will be staying in the rooms. Uh, Councillors, any other questions? Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker, Councillor. Chairman and members of the West Area Planning Committee, this planning application was controversial from the start. Therefore, my objections are on matters of principle community concern and location. For a number of weeks, rumours were circulating our town saying that there was going to be alterations to, to the Ulster Members Club to be a change of use to a bed and breakfast establishment. On hearing these rumours, I checked with the District Council Planning Office if there was a planning application for the Ulster Members Club and was told no. I asked this question a couple of times after this with the same response. 
When asked by residents about the matter, I responded that there were no plans in place, it was just rumours. I also reported this when asked at the Ulster Town Council meetings. On the 8th of May, I was in the Stratford District Council Planning Office and asked the question again and was told there was no planning application in for Ulster Members Club for a 31-bed bed and breakfast establishment. Later that day, I received an, an email from the planning office, uh, officer stating that the plans were currently invalid. Work on the building on both the internal and external um, commenced during the month of June. This was reported to the enforcement officer who visited the site and informed the club manager and the agent that if the work continued, it will be at the owner's risk. However, work was still taking place at the end of June, so I informed the enforcement officer again, who responded to me saying he had received a number of complaints regarding the ongoing work and that he had written to, to the agent confirming what he had said earlier regarding clients' risk work, uh, uh, clients' risk work ceased shortly after this. With regard to the location, the Members Club is on the edge of the Conway Estate, adjacent to a children's play area and surrounded by the Orbit-owned Jubilee Court, independent living complex, and is in close pro proximity to the Oversley House complex, which is again a retirement home, the McCarthy Stone retirement home, which has just opened for a retirement, and the recently completed creative care properties for people with learning difficulties and other health issues. I must admit that I am disappointed that the Town Council have withdrawn their objection. I have also had four telephone calls from persons who I believe were connected to the company, uh, asking if I am keeping my objection in place, and an email from the agent asking if I was now in a position to consider remo removing my standing objection on the application. I did not remove my objection, for if I did, my understanding is that the application would have been decided by officers' delegated powers, which I felt would not be appropriate in this case, bearing in mind my concerns as ward member and the concerns of the local community and the changes it would make for the immediate area. Chairman and members, these are the reasons I felt it should come before you tonight for a committee decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any questions, Councillors? I have one, if I may. Okay. Well, well a, a couple. Um, interesting. I, I don't know this business or whatever. I mean, you're obviously uh, very close to it. I mean, what, what sort of functions has it been holding? I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the intention here was, or it was claimed, that uh, the room was going around, functions were cancelled. I mean, do you, do you know how many functions this working men's club had? Well, I know that I, when the council uh, Adams was referred to, <coughs> It was a wedding, it was in July, and that was cancelled. I know other, other groups that were in there, I think it was something like Taekwondo and things like that. So some regular sure. groups used it, yeah. um, I used to men, uh, run a couple of bingos there years ago, um, but it, it has changed since then, I must admit. But I think they were, at one time, uh, advertised in free rooms uh, for a function. I'm, I'm sure there was a banner across the top saying that. Uh, okay, so the impression that it, it was still being used. Uh, it was still being functions. used, yeah. yeah, yeah. And just a second one was your comment on 119 members sort of voting for, uh, for this to be converted into what is effectively a bar and a, and a small hostel. I don't know where the 119 members came from. I, you know, I, I can't answer that because I don't know. I'm, in a, I'm just sitting here on behalf of... Uh, the community of also who have concerns about this, and that is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why I want it to be a committee decision and not my decision, because it you know, means such a lot to them, and I'm trying to be fair to them. Thank you, Councillor. That's very clear. Thank you. Right. We'll, uh, we'll now move on to uh, technical questions. Councillors. I've, I've got one. Could you put, please, the, the, the floor plan out? 
that's it. The, the, the proposed floor plan, yeah. This doesn't look like a bed and breakfast to me. It, it looks like a hotel. And I'm not sure whether there is a difference in planning terms between a bed and breakfast and a hotel. Uh, no, they're considered the, to be the same in planning use terms. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Kerridge. Uh, I'm sure there is one, but is there a, where's the kitchen on all that? I'm just concerned that if, you know, if they're offering breakfast. Yes. I'm sure there is, from what we've heard, yes. Actually, it doesn't matter. I'm quite convinced by the, the applicants' arguments, you know. Uh, <sighs> is this technical? Yes, yeah. Car parking, that's what I was going for before I fell asleep. Is there enough car parking for this number of rooms? It has been assessed by County Highways, who obviously assess it in terms of its current use as the members club and the difference in the number of car parking spaces of it change, part changing use to the bed and breakfast. Um, as part of the proposals, they have obviously proposed to extend the car parking slightly um, to the north of the existing building. And given the amount of trip rates that would be generated from a business and use of this type, it was felt that the number of car parking spaces was acceptable in this case. It strikes me that a working men's club at the corner of an estate will largely have people walk into it rather than driving to it, especially as they're going there to drink beer. Um, so I don't see the trip rates would be incredibly high at the moment. So I'm going on 31 beds, mm. full occupancy. How many car parking spaces are there? I, th I think the point is that, yeah, it probably is uh, most people would walk to it. The existing situation is that it does have very large car parking space anyway, which is probably underutilised. But specifically for the bed and breakfast use, which would obviously be the main people using cars, um, there's considered to be enough space overall. It probably would be a, a higher a use rate than the current use, um, but there's enough on site to accommodate that use. If it helps, Councillor, I've just counted and it's 40. I see there's some specifics about trees in terms of soft, soft landscaping. Are there any more specific details about the other boundary treatment and what's envisaged? Uh, yes, um, to the northern boundary between where the children's um, play area is, this is proposed to be a hedgerow, so a new hedgerow. It's currently a, a fence, so that's planned to be a hedgerow. And then obviously there's the main one is the tree um, landscaping area to the corner of the junction and then shrubs along the whole of the areas adjacent to the highway and also some further planting and uh, landscape into that area, um, which is obviously felt to be a benefit over the existing hard surfacing. Councillor Fielding. I'm just concerned, because when we were being briefed, you referred to it as a small kitchen. Is the kitchen commercially big enough to, to supply both the bar and also the bed and breakfast, etc.? Or are there kitchens in the rooms? Um, there's no kitchens in rooms. Um, I couldn't answer the terms about size of viability of business. I'm not an expert. I, I accept that. Um, Councillor Barnes. The, the ward member did say there used to be a lot of uh, dues there, if you want. Presumably there was car parking for that. The implication was that there wasn't as many dues now. What I'm saying is... No, not everybody would walk, would they? Um, not everyone. I mean, there was obviously quite a considerable, um, as you can see from this, there's quite a large car park in its existing use. So obviously, depending on functions, the type of events that are happening, you know, the car park occupancy rate is going to go up and down. Um, but I haven't had any notification about issues about overspill or anything like that from historical records. Okay, fine. And just one final technical point. Looking on this, there are some street lights here, um, and one of the conditions in the uh, in, in the, your, your uh, report is that um, lighting would be uh, 
pass off the conditions, what, what, what would you be proposing? Uh, we're not proposing anything at the moment, and there's nothing shown. It's um, if the applicant wishes to have some external lighting, they would need to submit a scheme which we would review. But I would expect it to be quite low key, just to highlight the building details and help people from the car park rather than anything too. Um, fine, fine, fine. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No, councillors. Um, let's open a debate. Councillor Giles. <coughs> Um, whilst I do take on board the um, concerns about the initial lack of consultation and problems, and, uh, and as usual, both Councillor Payne and, and Councillor Adams, although they're not speaking in her capacity as a councillor, always put Ulster very much at the forefront of their mind and, and speak and are, are very active in terms of speaking on behalf of the community. I have to say here, I do disagree with both of them. I actually find this proposal to be highly innovative, um, very entrepreneurial, and clearly a benefit in terms of helping the, this business, which we have evidence in the report requires diverse, diversification. And I think using one's common sense and general knowledge, one would expect, given changing circumstances and markets, it would require that. And I think this is an, an excellent way to do it. So um, I think the idea that they will, I actually think if this is successful in the way that the applicant has outlined, um, and there's every reason given that there are comparis comparators to suggest it would be, then there would be potentially a, a very large community benefit. If this is open for hot food, um, it rejuvenates the, the bar and the pub area, you've got then the potential for that to be open to the public and it to, that to be a greater community asset. Um, I also think there is a large benefit in, in some improvement to this site. So I would be uh, uh, happy to propose this for Grant, but what I would want to see is a note that in relation to the soft landscaping that the boundary treatment is substantial and good quality because I think this is a real opportunity to improve this site, particularly as we have a grade two listed building in the vicinity and that if there is going to be any external lighting and it may not be necessary and that might be quite a good thing, that it definitely needs to be sensitive as, as the officer has said, sensitive, low key, um, uh, uh, again, bearing in mind the presence of a listed building. So that would be the basis on which I would make uh, a proposal for grant. Thank you, Councillor. So that's a proposal with conditions. I mean, with notes. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Well, yes, I, I, I think it's a wonderful initiative, really. Look at it. We've got trees around it being used. Uh, if you wanted to use part of the hall, you could have a function and bed and breakfast. Uh, I think it'll save the club myself. I'm sorry that I don't agree with the board member, but um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm quite happy to second it. I think it'll be an improvement and an asset. Thank you. We have a proposal and a second. I'd just like to make one comment. Um, yeah, I understand that these businesses are struggling. My view here is the planning issue about whether this is going to be a going concern it is, is, is probably, well, it's not a planning issue. It's, it's down to commercial risk from the, the owner. But um, it strikes me that if this is successful, at least the bar will service the local uh, population and they'll have somewhere local to go rather than further afield. So I'm quite happy to support this. So we have a proposer. And we have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Fielding. Um, so the proposal is to grant planning consent in respect of application ref 17 oblique 01133 full. All those in favour? It's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor. Five, a two-minute break. Two-minute break, thank you.
Oh, thank you very much. I won't eat one of those at the moment. I'll wait until we... Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, apologies for the wait, but uh, it's all been worth waiting for, I'm sure. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is 17 slash 01875 slash 4, which is 61 Ships and Road, returning um, the first... Uh, sorry, okay, it's Eddie's going to do the um, introductions. Thank you, Chair. The application site is located within the built-up area boundary of Stratford-upon-Avon and is accessed off the Shipston Road. The western end of the site lies within the conservation area and abuts the tramway further to the west. This is an aerial photo of the site from the west showing the surrounding built form. This plan shows the proposed layout of the newly 11 dwellings. Uh, which would replace the single block of 12 flats to the rear. This slide shows the existing and proposed elevations from the Shipston Road. This slide shows the uh, rear of the um, Shipston Road building uh, and the proposed garage. Uh, from the last committee, the garage block uh, did have a flat up above it, so that has been reduced down inside and also hipped uh, roof added. Um, in addition to that, the rear um, decking area has been brought uh, further inwards so that it finishes here. This shows the proposed elevations of the western buildings, including that from the tramway. These are the front and, front and rear elevations of the three dwellings at the centre of the site. This photo is from the Shipston Road and shows the existing blocks, a block of flats in the centre. This photo shows the location of the proposed access adjacent to number 67. This photo shows the existing access uh, and number 61A on the right hand side. This is the rear of the site with the existing garages shown on the right, which are also to be demolished. This shows the rear elevation of number 61A, the existing boundary wall, which would be retained, and the existing access in the background. This is the current view from the tramway. This is the view of the neighbouring development, also from the tramway. Uh, finally, this is another aerial view of the site, this time from the east, showing the Shipston Road at the front and the tramway to the rear. Chairman, the recommendation is to grant permission subject to the completion of the Section 106 and the 23 conditions outlined on page 86. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, just remind members, this was deferred previously. Um, for further information, Eddie, can you just confirm that we have received all that information and it is now, uh, you're happy with that? Yeah, um, Councillor Richards proposed that the last committee for details of the, the raising of the properties above the floodplain um, and whether that was to the EA standard. And since that time, we have confirmed with the Environment Agency that the freeboard safety margin of 600 millimetres is the minimum they would require from the site, and that is what is proposed as part of this development. Thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker on this item is Mr. Garlick. Thank you, Mr. Garlick. Um, if you could just explain, you know, introduce yourself, and then you have three minutes in your own time. Thank you. I've never done this before, so I hope you'll bear with me a little bit. Of course you will. <laughs> um, yeah, I live, as you can, as you can guess, it happened, I happen to live right opposite uh, this proposed development. And uh, I'd like to object to it on the, on, some of the, on the following grounds. In my opinion, it is far too futuristic it doesn't blend in at all with the surrounding properties. A, a number of the properties, mainly the ones adjoining it, 67 and 69, have been very tastefully refurbished 
and the gentle, the owner has made a good job of them. And uh, the frontages of this proposed development, I feel, just my opinion, is that they should be of a similar construction. This whole development, whichever way you look at it, will stick out like a sore thumb. The height is also excessive. I know it's high now, but I don't feel that this should set a precedent for what's going to go in the future. The mixture of architecture on the Shipston Road is quite varied, and I think that the approach to the town, and some of them leave a lot to be desired without mentioning any names, I don't think this, the Shipston Road approach, I think it's quite reasonable, and I think that this should be preserved. Once these, once these things have been ruined, like so many things in this town, it's done. You can't undo it. If you look at this development from the tramway walk, it's, it's, over, it's overpowering, totally overpowering. If you look at it on the other side, where it's, where it's behind uh, Ashley Court, those, I think, they've been, they've been well done. I don't think you could make a much better job of them. Now, I have asked, this is about the fourth time, and why this vehicular access has been moved to the opposite side of the plot, i.e. from one side to the other. And I have yet to receive any response from anyone whatsoever to explain why this has been done. And I should like to ask this question. 30 seconds, please. I'm oh, sorry, who you finished on that? I do apologise. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you on that one. Um, is, that, is that it, is it? Yes, it is. you have your three minutes. Have you any more to say? Um, if it, You've got 30 if, seconds. Where, the, where, this, where it's all been moved up to the other side, this, this access, it's going to be very close to the lady's property who was here the last time. She can't be here tonight because she's in Warwick Hospital. Um, otherwise, she probably would be. And I was talking to her husband the other day, and this... This proposed development is literally, according to him, going to be a metre away from their property. And if you stand by their front door and you see a huge brick wall, and to say it's overpowering is the biggest understatement of all times. OK, I'll have to end you there, I'm afraid. Councillor Giles. Um, so, and I understand your, your principal objection is about the, the scale and the design of this particular proposal, and, and it's not in keeping with what's there. But would you accept that it, what is proposed there is certainly an improvement on, on what's there currently? This has been, this line of argument, this comment, has been stated to me by several people, and I'm sorry to say that I find that comment... Uh, is just not sensible. You could put anything there. You could put a warehouse there. You could, you could put a, an aircraft hangar there. It would look better. That is not the point. The point is to get something right and do it right first time. Because once it's done, it's done. You can't undo it. Okay, and this, uh, there's been so many... I'm not having... Well, you can take it how you like. There's been that many planning decisions made which... <laughs> lack, well, lack a lot of things, to be honest with you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Just for reference, um, the lady who objected previously has now withdrawn her objection based yeah, upon... I know changes. that the, this flat's been changed, but I, I said to her husband, I was standing talking to him at the front, to, at the front door, and I said, you can see your boundary there. And this, this wall, and it's a big wall, a bare wall, it's going to move about probably another four metres closer. Can't you just stop for a few seconds and just envisage it? Because it's going to affect him, not so much me. But I still would like to know the answer to this question as to why right. this access has been moved from there yeah, On to that there. particular point, I will ask that in our technical questions. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.
outcome. Right, our next speaker then is Liz Nicholson and Mike Briggs and Richard Coots. You have three minutes in your own time. Thank you. We're back here again. Um, we did go away from the last committee. We, we did have a serious think about ourselves, about the comments that were made at the last committee. Sorry, um, Eddie, we have some slides to show. So I, I just wanted to draw out some of the points that Eddie has already told you about. You can see the changes there to the, the garage. We have reduced that by taking the flat away. And that's brought a 3.6 metre reduction in the height of the garage that you, you raised a lot of concerns with last time. It's now at 4.4 metres in height, which is actually less than one of the existing buildings on the site, which is 5.5 metres. And I know that figure came up a lot last time we were at committee. So we're now below the height of the existing building. And then if you could show the second slide, please. And this was just to, to draw out, again, the changes that we've made at the back of that nearest house to 61A. So we've really pulled that decking away. It's just now a series of steps to get into the back of the house. And the screening is still there, obviously. And the other change we've made in terms of security is that the gate between those two properties is an exit-only gate. So people can't get into the site that way. They can only, people living there can come out, which I know was a concern to the neighbour. Um, and the neighbour now, having seen these, not only has she withdrawn the objection, she actually supports the scheme, if you, if you look at the comments. Um, there is an awful lot more I could say, but I want to give Mike time to talk about the flooding, which I know was a, an issue, and how the water management solutions have determined the height of those buildings on the Shipston Road frontage. Thanks, Liz. Can we have the next slide? <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so the flood risk issues were um, brought up last time, and I just want to confirm that the proposals do actually meet their in accordance with both national planning and local planning flood risk issues. The Environment Agency and the Lead Local Flood Authority have um, reviewed the proposals. They've given their approval conditions, essentially saying that we actually do what we say we're going to do. Reference was made last time to Ashley Court, and... Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, Ashley Court, which is nearby. Actually, the way that that was dealt with is fairly similar to what we are proposing on our site. We can go into that in detail if required. And the next slide, please. The exception test, this is one of the key tests to do with flood risk. And on the left-hand side in blue is the actual wording of the exception test. On the right-hand side are the measures that we are proposing to show that we have complied with this exception test, which is all about... 30 seconds, please. Thanks. All about um, developing in flood areas. We've done a flood risk assessment, which is reviewed and approved by the EA. We've taken on board existing and future conditions. We've looked at the um, various requirements in the exception test, which we meet. There's no increase in flood risk and there are various benefits on flood risk. So both the residents and the neighbours do benefit from that. Excellent, thank you. Um, right, members, are there any questions that you'd like to raise? Councillor Kerridge. I'm sure it's not particularly relevant, Chair, but uh, <clears throat> just out of politeness, really, uh, could you remind us uh, why the uh, uh, entrance has been swapped from one side to the other? I know there was a reason, but I can't remember what it was. I don't know that we talked about it that much last time. I think there's a number of reasons. Um, one of the key ones was how vehicles move within the site. Um, we get better visibility displays onto the road if we move the access. You've got easier turning circles within, particularly for emergency vehicles. It makes it a lot easier to create turning spaces for them. Um, and then from that, there's also views straight through the site. What we wanted to get was a, a slight sight line straight through that takes you down to the tramway and the, the, the area there so that you get those linkages between Shipston Road and the tramway. We felt in, in design terms that was quite important. I mean, there are other issues in terms of the costs of the flood engineering works are very high. So 
to do it differently, you'd have to start dropping the number of units, and then it just stops being viable. And so there were quite a few reasons why it's moved. Thank you very much. Councillor Fielding. I asked the question last time to do with why you'd moved it, and I was told that there was a power cable that was along there that could have been affected. You rather changed the story from what you told me last time, um, and you know, I still maintain you've been better off leaving the entrance. Do you have a question on this? The question is why, why, have, why have you sort of changed the story from one thing to the other? No, there, there is a power cable there, and there would be significant earthworks involved if, if we had to move that. I think we went away from the last committee and wanted to be able to explain to you better why it has been designed the way it is. Um, so it's, it, it is that power cable, but it's the other reasons with that, and it's the combination of costs. But it's, it's the asset that it brings. You, you move the buildings across, but that creates these views. So design is a, an amalgamation of all sorts of reasons that you put together. Just a, a quick one. Uh, the previous speaker said that the, um, the, 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 the new buildings don't blend in with the street scene. Would you like to just comment on that? If you want a really detailed explanation, I'll end up bringing in Richard because he's the architect. But I suppose my planner's point of view would be um, there is no point in just copying what you already have. We're here in the 21st century. You, we're, we're building buildings for the future. Um, there also has been a public consultation exercise. There were 500 leaflets put through doors. There were 40 or 50 people turned up to the public consultation exercise. Um, there was meetings with Councillor Rolfe, Councillor Organ. There was quite a lot of work went into talking about that design. Um, it's going to come down to whether you like it or not. But if you want more detail, Richard's here. No, I, I, that, that answers it for me. Thank you. Are there any other questions, members? Thank you very much. Um, technical questions of Eddie. Any technical questions? No? Okay, then I'm going to open up to debate. Councillor Giles. The neighbour's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually really grateful to the applicant and the hard work because it wasn't just a bit of a response to the concerns, it was a really fulsome response and I think that's really, I think that's so pleasing because often you'll get come back and it's a little bit shaved off and they, what, how can we do the bare minimum to get this through and actually that has been a genuine um, uh, worked up proposal to truly meet the concerns expressed by the neighbour and, and, uh, and I'm so happy that the result is that that neighbour actively supports this. Um, and I think this is now also the opportunity to say that and, and acknowledge that the expertise and hard work that's been brought to bear on this application means that this district is able to use plots of land like this to, that are already in the built-up area boundary to fit a decent amount of housing on that might otherwise go into disuse because it becomes a flood risk. So th there's a lot of hard work. There's a, a huge community benefit to being able to use this land. I do take on board the uh, objections, and, and design is a very subjective thing. I am actually on the very conservative, with a small c, end of the scale when it comes to design, and I, I tend to be in the more traditional camp. But I, there is a mix of styles on the Shipston Road, um, and I, I equally I take the point that just because something's an improvement on what's there, that's not a good reason to just just okay it through. But I actually I actually do think this is acceptable, and I think it will. It's, it's modern enough to provide something new and innovative, in it, but it's not too outrageous not to blend in. So for me, I'm extremely happy with all elements of the proposal. I propose to grant. Thank you. Um, I have to agree. I think it's nice to see the, uh, the response that has been brought back to this committee, which has been um, excellent. So I'm very pleased about that, and I echo that. Councillor Barnes, did you want to talk? Yes, I'm quite happy to second it, and I'm very pleased that They've listened, and you know there was a great amount of concern. I know the board members playing bridge again tonight. She was a bit surprised when I saw her, but as far as I'm concerned, it's it's better. It's helped everybody, and um, as far as I'm concerned, we can go to the vote. Members, the vote before you. Then we have a proposal. We have a second. The vote for you is for 17-01875-4. All those in favour. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. This committee therefore resolves to grant planning permission for 17-01875-4. Thank you very much.
The last item on the agenda this evening. <clears throat> Councillor Barnes is going. Yeah. Uh, oh. it's, 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 uh, yeah. Thank you, Peter. The last item on the agenda this evening is 17 slash 01072 slash 4. Chinois, I presume that's a correct pronunciation. Amy will tell me. And over to you. Thank you, Chairman. The application site denoted by the black dot is a semi-detached dwelling on Middletown Lane, Studley, within the West Midlands Greenbelt. The site is situated south-east of Middletown Lane, with open countryside to the north. So this slide shows an aerial view of the application site in relation to the neighbouring properties. So the application proposes a two-storey side and rear extension with the existing garage to be demolished, which um, is situated um, slightly to the rear of the property. The two-storey side extension and rear extension would have a ridge height to match the existing dwelling with an overall increase in the built form of 84%. Materials would be similar to those used in the existing dwelling. The proposed floor plans show the extent of the increase in built form to the side and the rear. Part of the rear extension would be retained as single storey. The front of the property is now being shown, which as you can see is mock Tudor in design. This image shows the side and front of the property when looking in a southwesterly direction towards the application site. Um, and finally, this image shows the separation distance between the application site and the adjoining property to the northeast. Um, so there is one update on the update sheet just to make you aware and chairman the recommendation is to refuse the application subject to the reasons which are detailed within the committee report thank you thank you very much our first speaker is uh, Keely Thompson on behalf of the applicant Keely you have three minutes in your own time thank you We moved into our dream home, sorry, we found our dream home when we moved into the parish 12 months ago. As a Catholic family with strong core values, our main focus has always been to provide our children with a safe, loving environment to be proud of. We have settled in well since moving into the parish and we have contributed to the village greatly in terms of donating the sign to the Green Dragon Public House, which is at the heart of the village and brings everyone together. However, since submitting our planning application in April, we have been forced down a route of uncertainty, given that we are now seven months on with no further developments. Andrew Watson came out to us. We discussed a compromise, which we paid another architect, David Taylor, of Stratford District Council, to resubmit, only to be then to be told to compromise on a different area entirely. The way that we have been dealt with during the process has caused unnecessary pain and suffering. From the supporting evidence I have provided, there have been several developments within the lane on a much bigger scale than what we are proposing which have been approved despite lying within the green belt. It is based on the examples provided that we consider our development is being taken out of context when being referred to as inappropriate development. Our proposal lies within a developed area with no consistent or uniform layout with a mixture of housing types and designs. Our proposal is intended to maintain the block proportions with the joining semi-detached unit, which has been granted an extension larger than our proposal. Furthermore, the access drive to the left of our proposal maintains a separation with the next block along, eliminating any compaction of the street scene. In addition, we note that reference has been made to the extension not being designed to be subservient. This was an informed design decision. This was to reflect the attached neighbour's extension, which does not take on the subservient form. It also maintains a continuous ridge line with no step down. By continuing this theme through, the overall built form of the block would look original and not draw the eye to untidy steps within the roofscape, proving in keeping with the street scene with a, value to with an with a, sorry, with a view to increase value. As new homeowners to the village, we are struggling to understand why we have been met with such adversity. Both ourselves and our architects are at a loss as to why our proposal is being recommended for refusal when the adjacent house next door has done the very same thing on a larger scale. The reasons have not been outlined clearly to us to give us anything definitive as to why our project cannot proceed. 
We believe the treatment that we have received is unfair and has led us to research past and present situations seconds, in the district. We find our application being particularly unfair that we are not able to create a spacious home for our family, yet others have been granted that privilege within the statutory period. Our feelings of being victimised are further reinforced as we have received the full support and backing from our fellow neighbours with no objections and no threat to the environment and our proposal has been well received by each of the five members of Sanborn Parish Council who fully support us in the scheme even prior to the compromises which we were forced to make. Spot on, three minutes, absolutely perfect, well done, I thank you. I myself about 20 times, thank you. Um, first thing I'd like to say, I, I, I'm sorry that you feel you've been messed about by the by the system. That's that's unfortunate, and um, it shouldn't really happen. So uh, these things do, unfortunately. But uh, I apologise on behalf Thank of the you. authority for that. Thank you. Um, right, members, are there any questions? Councillor Giles and Councillor Lawton. Sure. I did actually come into the offices before two o'clock um, yesterday to hand in some documentation. Um, I then received a phone call today to say that the committee members hadn't received it. Can I email it over? And that had images of the street scene of various different houses with huge glass facades. There was also another image um, of a bungalow that had sort of had planning application granted for a double storey extension which had gone above the hedge line. Um, it's a huge um, change as to what it was prior. I don't. Yeah, if you've not received it, I don't know if. No, well, yeah, that's just what we've got. Sure. Um, can, can I just, Councillor I say there, there have been some um, documentation from yourself, but they've been sent around. Uh, Karen, do you want to just answer that particular point? Just to clarify, um, of the examples that have been cited, um, Hallafield uh, application dated uh, or application reference 13 slash 0118 full, um, Hayden's uh, application 0802302 full, and um, in fact, those are the two two examples given. Both of those predate the core strategy. Thank you. No, um, sorry, uh, Councillor Lawton. Oh, Ch uh, Ch Ch Chairman, uh, Councillor Jones asked my question. That's usual. That's okay. As usual. Okay. <laughs> are those two examples on this on Middleton Lane. They are. Yeah. Yeah. I just can't see them on the map. Just wondering which, where the, maybe the officers can, can help me identify where they are. Especially Hayden's, I'd be interested to know where that is. Opposite to the left. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that. Right. That's further down, but still on Middletown Lane. Mm. Okay, I think this would be something that we'd have to reconsider. In the, I, I don't know if it's necessarily relevant to this particular application, because at the end of the day, we are looking at this application, uh, not necessarily in relationship to others. Uh, that's a planning process, I'm afraid. We have to abide by that. Do you mind if I ask, did you receive the, bird, the bird's eye view of both properties? Our property with the adjoining. Oh, you've got that. Yeah, yes, actually, I've got the. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and any other questions? Councillor Carriage. Just one. Sorry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, how is your design going to sort of blend in with your your neighbour? Uh, our neighbour has had exactly the same um, extension. In fact, we're actually um, coming in three foot from the boundary line. Um, and that's to keep um, the build square and not offset. So it's to keep the existing boundary all square. Um, next door have actually gone out to the boundary line. Um, the idea of us proposing to keep the ridge line straight was to follow through and keep a sympathetic um, view when looking at the property from the street scene. Um, both neighbours either side are fully supportive of that, along with the five members of the parish council have got no issues 
whatsoever with the overall design impact or any harmfulness to the green belt. There's nothing at all, no objections have came upon that. Yeah, I, I've just been, well, do you want to mention it? Chair, we've, we've in fact tracked the, um, traced the planning permission for the uh, other half of the property. Um, double, bed, double garage with bedroom over approved 19th of April 1979. So it's a, it's a very old extension, very old application. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? I, I'll ask it. Fine, that's okay. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you just turn the microphone off? Lovely, thank you. Um, Councillor Wright isn't here. So, technical questions. Um, so, is, I'm looking at this bird's, it's quite helpful, this photo, this bird's eye photo. Is what's being proposed largely going to look similar to what is going on in that neighbouring property? Sort of to mirror it, or has it got additional bits at the back, or...? Okay, so as you can see from this photo, um, by comparison to next door, um, the application site extension will um, go around the rear um, at two-storey level with um, a single-storey extension as well, um, which is there in current form. Um, so you can see the difference between the two properties quite clearly in that image. So it sort of squares off that rear extension yeah. yeah, it links around to the rear from the side. In, in terms of the, the, the size, obviously this is the, the, the major concern here. Um, we're obviously removing a rather unattractive um, garage at the rear, which is a very sizable double garage. We're, we're, we're replacing it. I mean, have, have you factored in the fact that you're getting rid of a rather big garage and putting a smaller one in, or, 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 or doesn't that apply, is my question? Okay, um, unfortunately, um, I, I'm not the case officer that's dealt with um, the application um, throughout the process. Um, from reading the report, um, I'm, I'm not quite clear whether or not um, the garage has been included within the assessment. Um, obviously, in Greenbelt terms, we would consider um, built form on the site, um, and it would be within a reasonable proximity from the existing dwelling. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't quite clarify any further on that um, but from looking at the size of the extension um, my, my opinion would be that I don't think it would offset it um, and would still result in a disproportionate addition okay well thanks Councillor Fielding first and then Councillor is there, is there a gap between the side of the house and the, the hedge for taking stuff down between the two properties I mean, to the back of the property. So I think, I think, I've, I think I'm following you. So there will be um, a small gap left between um, the existing boundary treatment. Um, as you can see, the gap will be reduced um, quite largely. Um, however, between the application site and next door, there is um, a, a sort of access path which I, I assume goes um, further down into the field. So, so there would be significant gap between the properties um, to consider um, that it wouldn't have um, an impact from a street scene. I'm, not, sh I'm not sure that was the question. The question was a gap down the side of the house and their boundary. Things like, for example, wheelie bins and, and access down the side of the, the, the property. Sorry, yes. um, I, I misunderstood what you were saying. Um, so. Obviously, there would be limited gap, um, as you can see, to the rear of the property, and from the drawings, it would show that it would be difficult to get a wheelie bin down the side of the property. However, um, given the setback from the road, that's not to say that there isn't sufficient space to the front of the property for um, refuse bins to be stored, stored to the front of the property. And with regards to, obviously, other items, that would be more difficult so I, I, I can't obviously speak on behalf of the applicant as to what their intentions are 
Councillor Jones. Um, so on the front of the committee report, it says third party responses, one letter received a concern about impact on the living room window. Am I right in assuming that comes from Tudor House? Because I, I can't, well, it can't be the other side. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not sure which property it refers to, um, but within the officer's report, it is stated that the development does not infringe upon any 45, 25 degree lines from the centre of neighbouring habitable room windows of the adjoining properties. And I take from that looking at this plan, there is no window on the ground floor side that would look into that anyway, or no, or, what have we got? I mean, th there's a big gap anyway. I'm not... I'm, I'm just sort of really covering all bases here, but. So from, let's go to the elevations, that's probably the easiest point of view. Um, so there would be um, two side windows at first and ground floor, which would look in a westerly direction towards Tudor House. From having a look at the floor plans, um, one of those, the ground floor would serve a breakfast kitchen room and the um, first floor would serve an ensuite, which you would normally assume would be obscure glazed or could condition to ensure that is obscure glazed. Councillor yes. Apologies, Chairman. Just, just, the, the, the number of this seems again to be the size. Now, uh, just so I'm clear, um, our new core strategy, uh, where you're citing CS10, and uh, CS20. Um, when you're looking at the uh, uh, next door neighbour, and that was in 1979, that was obviously under a different strategy. Um, uh, do, could do anybody know whether there is a material difference? Or in 79, were you going back to the old 30% rule? That might be a bit tough. Hazarding a guess, I suspect the 30% rule was applying because that would have been. Um, 79, 89, 2000, that's what, 30, 30, 28 years ago? So. Yeah. I, I, I'm old enough to remember that, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I shall open up for debate. Councillor Jones. Um, Okay, I definitely disagree with the second reason for refusal on here, which is about thing, uh, extensions being an appropriate scale and subservient, because I think the applicant has given a very good uh, reason and justification as to why you wouldn't have a subservient extension here. And I think that makes in entire sense looking at what's been done with the neighbour. And I think it's exactly right to say if you were going to build an extension, you'd want it to be all one thing. Um, and equally, I don't think... Uh, so putting aside from the green belt uh, perspective, I don't think there is anything um, inherently disproportionate about that uh, extension. So I, I just don't agree with reason two. So in terms of reason, reason one, the green belt obviously is an important consideration. Um, and for me, it's quite finely balanced. However, I would be um, minded in favour of actually granting this on the basis that I think I, I, agree, I agree with um, Councillor Lawton's observation. I do actually think removal of that garage, particularly given it, the nature of it and its design, would be a significant benefit, not just because of the size of the garage, but also because of the design and look of the garage. And I, I actually think here it is a... It is false to fail to consider what has gone on with the neighbour. Now, yes, it happened in a different era. It happened before these policies, and we must judge this application in accordance with current policy. But on the other hand, it can't be right to completely ignore the context in which this is proposed. And so I think taking all of those things into account, for me, on these specific circumstances, and bear in mind the mitigation of getting rid of that garage, I don't consider this to be a disproportionate addition on these very particular circumstances. So as long as there are appropriate conditions that the planning officers were satisfied with, including the uh, obscure glazing of the ensuite bathroom on the top floor, then I would be um, uh, uh, happy with a grant of this. Councillor Lawton. Thank you. If you could go back to the floor plans, please. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, it is the quantum here. 
and if this was before us and where the new breakfast kitchen is proposed, just an extension of that area, I don't think we'd have any issue. Um, the, the thing is, we've got a dining room and a bedroom, one over the top. Um, it is a big extension. Um, I would prefer that the bedroom over the top wasn't there because I'm pretty, if that was granted with a breakfast kitchen, I'm pretty sure that uh, that dining room could be built at single storey under uh, prescriptive rights. So <laughs> we're talking about that extra bedroom. I would agree with Councillor Giles that I think the quantum is diminished by the, uh, by the, the loss of the garage. And I just, although it is a big building, I don't think it's disproportionate, and I don't think we're going against CS10 by going against the officer's recommendation in this particular interest or this particular case. So, again, I, I would be happy to propose, if I could find a seconder, that we grant consent for this application. Councillor Fielding. I'm quite happy to go along with the other two. My only concern is that gap between the hedge and the house um, for getting materials down beside, unless they come some arrangement with the landowner who has the uh, right of way on the, fit, the road beside them. But I, I, I'll go along with it. Thank you. First thing, I, I, I need to have a real hard think about this one. Councillor Giles says that she doesn't agree with uh, um, number two on this one. First of all, saying... What you're saying to me is you do not consider this to be overly large. No, the green, in the context of Greenbelt, there's a, there's a question about it. But if, imagine this wasn't Greenbelt, because that's well, what, well, well, yeah. We are in Greenbelt. We have to no, consider no. it as Greenbelt. Yeah, I agree. That, but reason one is considering the Greenbelt aspect. But reason two is our general policy about extensions being subservient and of an appropriate scale. And what I'm saying is actually... Yeah, I, I think this is an appropriate scale, and I think there's a good reason why it shouldn't be subservient. So that's why I'm saying I disagree with reason two, personally. Um, the other one is, if you are going to propose this, or any, anyone is going to propose it, then we have to have special circumstances for approval of this within the Greenbelt. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an exception to the Greenbelt rule, as long as we don't consider it to be a disproportionate addition. And I think um, my reasoning is, on these particular facts, in this particular location, bearing in mind the modification to the neighbouring property and the demolition of the garage, and the fact that there is already a rear extension, I think, on balance, on fine balance, this isn't a disproportionate extension. Okay, that's a, an opinion. That's your opinion. That's fair enough. Um, anyone else want to speak on this? Because I, I, I can't go along with that, I'm afraid, because looking at it, I think it is a large extension. I think it fills the plot, and we have refused numerous um, applications recently, including the one that came before us this evening, Tiddington Road, for filling the plot right across its width. And again, that says to me that it is too large for its plot. It's filling the, filling the plot width. That I, I still say it is overly large, and I agree with this, the argument on subservience. That is, a, that is something else. That I know we have a policy on that, and it is something that we can actually override if we so desire. And if, for example, we did on, um, on in Stratford not that long ago, where the majority of the houses weren't subservient, and it would look silly if that one had been. So we can take a judgment on that, and that's what we can do. So in that particular context, I have no, no major problems, but I, don't, I, I can't agree. I still think it is overly large. Hold on. Okay, I've just been asked to say, Karen, do you feel it is small scale then? If I can firstly refer you to the committee report, um, Impact on neighbour, impact on neighbour, oh no, sorry, I'm just trying to find, uh, conclusion, the Greenbelt um, increase of 84% over the existing dwelling. Turning to policy CS10, category B, a small scale extension or alteration of a building or the replacement of an existing building of the same use. As long as the replacement building um, uh, or extension, and I take that to imply extension as well, is not materially larger than the one it replaces. So the issue is 
whether it is materially larger. Yes. Now, the officer's assessment is that an 84% increase, extension increase over and above the existing does constitute, is in conflict with that policy because it is materially larger and therefore does not constitute small scale. In which case, if you were looking to approve it, you would need very special circumstances um, and the officer's report does specify that none have been put forward. So there is no justification put forward to override the Greenbelt policy. Uh, Ross first and then Councillor Kerry. The, the, through you, Chair, the, the, the test is, is it a small-scale extension? Um, if it isn't small-scale and we're told it's an 84% increase, then you have to show very special circumstances. Councillor Kerridge. Yes. About time. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, but I've, been, I've had my hand up for a while. We've had a lengthy explanation, another explanation, before I got in. Sorry, Chair. I was just getting a bit angry. I've, I've just read CS10 again. Okay, uh, I, I find myself unusually disagreeing with an officer on, on a matter of actual policy, and that's unusual because I have been told it's my understanding that a small scale extension of a building uh, is acceptable. We've got that small scale. You go to the explanation, right? Explanation 4.12. The extension or alteration of a building provided that it does not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the original building. It's, there's nothing about material, a material increase. That's if you're rebuilding it. But if you're just extending it, of course it's going to be materially bigger. That's, it, can't, it can't not be. So the materially bigger bit is for a rebuild. Okay? The small scale, which is what we're saying it is, is for an extension. I can't accept that you can have a, any kind of extension which isn't materially larger than what you're extending. I mean, it's just impossible. So I think we've got to ignore this materially larger bit and go with the words here, is it disproportionate? Yeah. And we don't think it's disproportionate, so we do not need very special circumstances. If that's your opinion. That's my and opinion. That obviously is contrary to the officers. Did you want to say? Uh, just to, to repeat, the test in the policy is, is small scale. Um, so members need to decide whether it's a small scale extension or not. But, but can I ask, is Councillor Kerridge right when he says the explanation, i.e. the definition of small scale, is one has to consider whether it's disproportionate? Is, is that correct? Yeah. Dis I'm not sure that small scale is defined, Karen. Do you? Um, no, I can't see. I'm not aware of any any specific definition of small scale. It, it's a I think it's a matter of planning judgment what small scale is. But there is an explanation in our policy that explains it. It might not define it, but it explains it. Uh, it's the um, third bullet point down on page 70 of our <coughs> plan. 4.1 to bullet point 3. Yeah. The, ex the extension or alteration of a building provided that it does not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the original building. Full stop. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the wording of the policy is small scale, and, that, and that's the policy. And clearly that explanation is there to help guide your planning judgment. Um, so, so small scale and, and disproportionate are kind of very similar questions. Okay. I, I, again, I, I completely agree with Councillor Charles and Kerridge. It's all about proportion. This is actually quite a small house, and it's actually having a, a, an extension, which is 84%. But it, looking at it from my judgment, and I have to use old money, I'm afraid, it's about 700, 750 feet. Now, that, that's not a large extension. It's just large proportion when you consider what, what, it's, what it's being adjoined to. I mean, a large extension is sticking 3,000 square feet, and you've got 1,000 square feet. I just don't think turning a three-bedroomed 
detached, or to, sorry, terraced house into a four bedroom terraced house is, is, is overdevelopment. I'm going to stop it. Just Karen, one more point, and then I'll take one more question, and that's it, okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I do stand corrected in terms of the. Um, <laughs> what, I would <laughs> what I would refer you to is page 72, uh, the policy, um, which is in block development management considerations. An extension to a dwelling must not result in a building disproportionately larger compared with the original building. Um, the, and a replacement building must not be materially larger. But I think the first part of that sentence is the critical part in terms of your assessment. And the final point. I just want, so I just want to answer those two points. So one of the reasons I don't think it's disproportionate is when it's viewed in the context of its neighbour. And secondly, yes, filling the plot would usually be problematic, and that's usually something that would not be in keeping. But again, the neighbours fills the plot. You know, the reason it's not accepted in other places is because we see lots of gaps and then someone wants to cram their plot. Whereas here, this is in context and that's the reason I'm happy that it's proportionate. Right, I think we're going to end the uh, debate on that point. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. A lively debate. Um, I think, did I get a proposal? Yeah. Councillor Lawton, do I have a seconder on that? Yeah. The, the, uh, the vote before you is to grant planning permission for 17 slash 01072 slash 4. All those in favour? Sorry, with, hold on a second before we vote. With the conditions? Yeah, and also, are we happy with the. Well, yes, we are happy with the. The view of the committee on this one. Okay, sorry, again, I so say all those in favour of granting plan permission? Against? This committee therefore resolved to grant plan permission for 17 slash 01072 slash 4. Thank you very much, Steve. That's the end of the meeting. That's the end of the meeting. And I have yet to do the minutes, but. Oh, didn't I ask about that?